Hello, how are we all? <clears throat> uh, she's being ironic, Pippa. She's not saying that JK Rowling is actually subject to witch hunts, is my impression from the video. I hope I'm not proven correct about that. That would be unfortunate. We'll wait for more people to roll in. And then we'll get going. Flops. Hello, cat. Hello, Hyan. Is that how you pronounce it? Hyan? <clears throat> Shaihalud and Dietrich. My mysterious benefactors. How are you? Isn't J.K. Rowling being targeted, though? I mean, she's being targeted for criticism, but it's not... They aren't witch hunts. <clears throat> what am I drinking today? I am drinking... A Hoyne Dark Matter. Which is fantastic if anyone hasn't tried it before. It's a very nice, very dark, but not bitter uh, craft beer. It's one of my favorites, but not my actual favorite. It's a response to the Witch Hunts podcast, yeah. <sighs> Alright. So what's on the docket today? But we're going a bit long tonight. Um, and I'll be off tomorrow, and then on Tuesday I'll be on a panel. Um, and then I will be away for a few days. There will be uploads in that time. Um, but they will be past segments. And uh, then hopefully we'll have a video essay out for you probably the day after the uh, femoid debate, the lab debate on the 2nd of May. <clears throat> and then we'll be returning uh, finally again to, um, you know, more usual content. Panel for what? I can't say, but it will be interesting. It'll be very interesting. I am sworn to secrecy. Get away from that pollen. I wish I was going that far. Alas. So we're going to go through the video. Um, and uh, I think we're primarily interested in some of the later chapters because I think she's actually pretty solid on the beginning portions. Um, and then we're going to look at some of the responses to the video that are not ours. Um, I want to look at Vosh's first of all, and I want to look at Demon Mama's. And if anybody else stands out, I would like to look at those as well, but I think those are the two that I really want to get down. Um, obvious reasons, uh, Vosh is targeted in the video at some point, and uh, I generally have developed a pretty high regard for Demon Mama's uh, reads on things, so we'll be using that as well. <clears throat> Alright, well, put that out of the way. Nope, that's the wrong one. Huzzah! There we go. Maybe we'll make myself a little bit bigger.
All right. I am still a little bit sick, so we may we may take breaks every now and then, but I think I think we'll make it. I think we'll do it. <clears throat> Xena and Poppy did a good one. Depending on how long it is, maybe I'll look at that one. Need to watch the follow up for a DM if you're going to check out DM. Yeah, I'll do that. I think the follow up one will probably give a summary of the original take, anyways, so that'll be worth that'll be worth looking at for sure. All right. Well, with that out of the way, I guess we should just dive into this monstrosity. Hour and fifty five minutes. We'll be here all night. Sar, I'm going to talk about Joro once again, but first, story time. Chapter 1, Anita. The most famous bigot in American LGBT history is a woman called Anita Bryant. This is her story. 1977 was not a good time to be gay. Is it ever really a good time to be gay? In 1969, the Stonewall Riots forced gay rights into national consciousness. The first Pride Parades were held in the summer of 1970, and in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association... I don't know what that is, but that terrifies me. ...declassified homosexuality as a mental disorder. Is that a... is that a mask? What's that photo? I, I'm not familiar with that photograph. What is that? I hope that's not a person's actual face I just dissed. That would be unfortunate. <clears throat> Is there, uh, are there sources in here? Okay. But only after gay activists disrupted their conference and shouted, Gay conversion therapy is torture. We have abnormal urges and we will not be silenced. <laughs> Because that's the only Thanks way to get anything check. done in this country. You have to be super annoying about it. They give you no choice. On January 18th, 1977, Dade County, Florida, known for such popular cities as Miami, approved a law that added the phrase affectional or sexual preference to its non-discrimination ordinance, effectively banning housing and employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And it was just then, as things seemed to be getting better, that Anita Bryant made her little appearance. Anita Bryant, Miss Oklahoma! Anita Bryant is a native Oklahoman who once had a career as a pop singer, beauty queen, and spokeswoman for the Florida Citrus Commission. Come to the Florida sunshine tree. My twins love 100% orange juice from Florida any time of day. Orange juice from Florida! It isn't just for breakfast anymore! Orange juice with natural vitamin C from the Florida sunshine tree. She was known for these TV commercials with the tagline, A day without orange juice is like a day without sunshine. Breakfast without orange juice is... I live on the west coast, I see no sunshine. Like a day without sunshine. Cute. When Anita heard her pastor speak about this non-discrimination ordinance, she felt a divine disturbance in her heart. How touching. Oh, that's John, just Yandexed it. It's John Fryer. <clears throat> John Ursel Fryer, M.D., was an American psychiatrist and gay rights activist, best known for his anonymous... Oh, I see. Okay. Jesus Christ, he picked a scary mask. For his anonymous speech at the 1972 American Psychiatric Association. Let me pop that on the screen here for you so you can kind of see what I'm reading. Uh, that event has been cited as a key factor in the decision to remove homosexuality as a mental illness from the APA Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Hmm. Cool dude. Looks like, uh... Uh, looks a little bit like a Mike Myers who's let himself go, but good dude. Good for him. It's an abomination! As a mother, she would not stand for this. So Anita wrote a letter to the county commissioner saying, As a concerned mother of four children, I am most definitely against this ordinance amendment. I have never condoned nor taught my children discrimination against anyone. 
But if this ordinance amendment is allowed to become law, profits. you will, in fact, be infringing upon my rights and discriminating against me as a citizen and a mother to teach my children God's moral code as stated in the Holy Scriptures. Anita, kill your shitty child. When the amendment passed, Anita created a campaign for its repeal, the Save Our Children Coalition, which sponsored provocative TV ads implying that gay people are degenerates who ruin communities and seduce children. The campaign has been vicious. With television commercials, the Save Our Children group is appealing to parental anxieties saying gays will flaunt their homosexuality before impressionable children. The Orange Bowl Parade, Miami's gift to the nation, wholesome entertainment. But in San Francisco, when they take to the streets, it's a parade of homosexuals, men hugging other men, cavorting with little boys. Save Our Children sparked the first organized backlash to gay rights in the United States, escalating the conflict into a national controversy. On one side were the gay rights activists, who argued that non-discrimination was a matter of human rights. On the opposing side, Anita Bryant argued that the non-discrimination ordinance would give special privileges to homosexuals. As long as they don't want to flaunt their homosexuality, they have equal rights the same as anyone else. In other words, gay people already have equal rights, just as long as they stay in the closet and don't do anything gay. That's very helpful. Thank you so much, Anita, for standing up for our right to be gay in secret. As long as they do their job and do not want to- This is a fundamental weakness of a liberal conception of justice in the first place where, um, what is just is equated to what is fair from the vantage point of law, not fair in terms of effect. Um, because it's, it's, it's uh, sort of a dogmatic constitutionalism where the writ of the law is supposed to take over individual human judgment. So if something is, is not touched by law, it doesn't exist. That's not actually how even liberal states are run. This is why sovereign citizens are funny, because they actually think the world works like that. But that's basically the kind of logic that's being deployed when people make this kind of argument. It's like, yeah, technically, look, gay people have the same right to marry people of the opposite sex that everybody else does, which is true, but it misses the point. <laughs> Anita also argued that allowing flaunting homosexuals to teach children was tantamount to gay recruitment. Just biologically, the God made mothers so that we could reproduce homosexuals. Cannot reproduce biologically. You heard her. God made mothers so she could reproduce homosexuals. Hallelujah. It's the exact same argument that's being used today by right-wing politicians who claim that queer people are groomers. Stop confusing our babies with your groomer gender ideologue. This wicked book, me and Earl and the dying girl, sexually indoctrinated with wicked, vile books. And she believes in traditional marriage between a man and a woman, and in that book it talked about two moms. Stay away from the children creep or you will regret it. People should definitely arm themselves, I agree with that. The Democrats are the party of pedophiles. The Democrats are the party of, of teachers, uh, elementary school teachers trying to trying to transition their elementary school age children and convince them they're a different gender. They're just evil people and they want to groom kids. Yeah. They're recruiting. If you don't know what furries are, it's where school children dress up as animals, cats or dogs, during the school day. They meow and they bark. What a great Oh no, I wanted to see more of that guy. That was that was such a character. The country we live in. I love Aww. it so much. Gay people around the country rallied against Anita Bryant and Save Our Children. There was a national boycott of Florida orange juice, with many gay bars taking screwdrivers off the menu and replacing them with an apple juice and vodka cocktail called an Anita Bryant. Let's make one now. Forgot my cocktail measure, so I'm just gonna have to eyeball this. Just a dash of apple juice. Give it a stir. It sounds so vile. <laughs> Needs a garnish. Stunning. I mean, it's not as good as a screwdriver, but if I was in the 70s, 
I would have thrown back so many of these goddamn things out of pure spite. There's a story that Troy Perry, the founder of the gay affirming metropolitan community church, was on a transcontinental flight. And when the attendant put a glass of orange juice on his- It's always like, it's always like fruity drinks with a spirit base. Like just, I don't know. I don't know, like, not, a, not everybody likes this sugary shit. I feel left out here. Trey said, take that away. I'm a homosexual. At gay pride marches in 1977 and 78, anti-Anita Bryant slogans featured prominently on t-shirts, signs, and buttons. Anita Bryant sucks oranges. A day without lesbians is like a day without sunshine. True. God, such an innocent time. Can you imagine, like, such, such decorum. You never see this anymore on Twitter. And meanwhile, Anita's campaign inspired more anti-gay legislation, including- Like, I, I like this because they were clever. They, they didn't project themselves just by being sort of crass and violent, as everybody does now. And it's just how it is, so there's not really, not, nothing you can do about it. Just as an aesthetic choice. Those, those anti-Brian slogans are clever. I like them. They're pithy bans on gay adoption and same-sex marriage, both of which passed in the Florida Senate, as well as the failed Briggs Initiative in California, which would have forced public schools to fire gay teachers. So Anita Bryant was worse than a bigot. She was an influential bigot, but she may also have helped to unify and galvanize gay activists by providing them with a common enemy. According to historian Lillian Faderman, Anita Bryant created fervent activists out of those who'd previously been content simply to enjoy their newfound freedoms. Faderman cites Eric Hoffer's op- I should read that book. Hang on, let me find it quickly. The Gay Revolution, The Story of the Struggle. Brilliant. It's a boring ass cover though. Observation that a mass movement can get along fine without a god, but it won't get along at all without a devil. For gay people all over the country, Anita Bryant became that devil. Mass movement can get along fine without a god, but it won't get along at all without a devil. I mean, maybe. I don't know. So even though she succeeded in her initial goal to repeal the non-discrimination ordinance, there is no question that, in the long term, Anita Bryant was the loser. She took a lot of L's. Rip. That must be super hard for her. For the short remainder of her career, gay activists protested her events. They shut down the tour for her book about how persecuted she was by the militant homosexual, and they succeeded in turning public opinion against oh, Anita Bryant. That would be fun to look at, actually. Hang on, let me see if I can't find that. What's that called? They shut down the tour. The Anita Bryant story. Or for her book Let's about how persecuted- This window. Damn it, Windows. The Anita Bryant. Oh, is it not there? I spelled that right. Damn it. Somebody find me a PDF of this. I want to laugh at it later. Executed she was by the militant homosexual, and they succeeded in turning public opinion against Anita Bryant to the point that she became virtually unemployable in mainstream entertainment. And it helped that she came across as kind of a judgmental prude that even hip straight people didn't want to be associated with. Our top story tonight, Anita Bryant, former mediocre actress and orange juice promoter, <laughs> performed coitus in public yesterday and <laughs> campaigned to promote heterosexuality. We don't serve orange juice anymore. Like she famously told Playboy magazine. Why do you think the homosexuals are called fruits? It's because they eat the forbidden fruit of the tree of life. <laughs> God referred to men as trees and because mm. the homosexuals eat the forbidden fruit which is male sperm. Oh my God. Like the woman is heterosexual cringe. This is how you lose the culture war. So let's all squeeze a fruit for Anita. Pass a little juice around. And of course, 
There was the famous incident where a gay activist smashed a banana cream pie in Anita's face during a TV appearance. And went into a place called Norfolk, Virginia, and were met with protest and uh, um, all kinds of problems. And uh, uh, every... Oh, oh. Security agents, security agents. No, no, let him stay. No. Let him stay. Well, at least it's a fruit pie. My God, what a different time. She, nobody's crying like, assault! <sighs> Miami-Dade County finally reinstated the non-discrimination ordinance in 1998, and they added gender identity to its protections in 2014. Like, all else aside, you never have to hand it to these people, but if that was J.K. Rowling, you would never hear the end of this. In 2021, Anita took another metaphorical pie to the face when her granddaughter, Sarah Green, came out as gay, announcing Oof. her marriage to a woman and publicly struggling with whether to even invite her grandmother to the ceremony. It's very hard to argue with someone who thinks that like a, an integral part of your identity is just uh, an evil delusion. <sighs> that it is, Sarah. That it is. So that's the story of Anita Bryant as students of LGBT history know it. But isn't it a bit one-sided? Wasn't there a lot of toxicity on both sides? The Anita Bryant forces talk of absolute truth and morality. Gay leaders are equally dogmatic about human rights. A plague on both the houses. Isn't it cruel even to slur Anita as a bigot and a homophobe? In fact, isn't it possible that Anita Bryant was like when Lacan wanted to debate the situationist who threw water on him during a lecture? Really? Damn, I want to read Lacan now, but I've already spent my book budget on a the complete Spinoza. The real <clears throat> victim? Oh no. Oh no! <laughs> ah, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I'm eating my pie. I'm eating my goddamn pie. Chapter 2. The Witch Trials of Anita Bryant. God help us all. The mainstream media would have us believe that Anita Bryant is a so-called homophobe, some kind of hateful bigot. But isn't this just an authoritarian tactic used to silence valid concerns? Mothers in this country are worried about their children going to school to be taught by perverts. Hey, this How is the be so this is the music that's from uh, Tarkovsky's Solaris. It's at the very beginning. Or that the militant homosexuals weren't the real bigots. Isn't it possible that Anita Bryant was the first victim of cancel culture, of, dare I say it, wokeism? Well, no, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. But suppose that you're an idiot, and suppose that that's the narrative you wanted to promote. Well, what would be your argument? I mean, if someone put a gun to my head and forced me to make that argument, I'd probably say something like this. Anita Bryant lived a difficult life. In 1940, she was born into brutal Hang on, wait, wait, we need a clip. Rural... One sec. I'd probably... This is important, okay? Of, dare I say it, wokeism? Well, no, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. But suppose that you're an idiot, and suppose that that's the narrative you wanted to promote. Well, what would be your argument? I mean, if someone put a gun to my head and forced me to make that argument, I'd probably say something like this. I Anita whatever. Bryant lived a difficult life. In 1940, she was born into brutal poverty in rural Oklahoma. Her parents divorced when she was just two years old, the same year she made her singing debut at the Baptist Church. Parts of my childhood, I blocked out because it hurts too much. I guess I was happiest when I was eight years old, and my parents were remarried, and I was baptized and came to know Christ as my personal savior. Her father abandoned the family again when she was 12. It was real painful, and it just about killed my mother. She was a very submissive wife. She was too submissive, and it angered me. She let my dad step all over her. Because of him, I think I went through life for a long time hating all men. Anita described her most intense adolescent memory as a feeling of intense ambition. A relentless drive to succeed at doing well the thing I loved. Glory, glory, hallelujah, it's true. But Anita's ambition conflicted with her submissive role as a traditional Christian woman. In 1960, Anita married Bob Green, Miami's top disc jockey, though only after he relentlessly badgered her into it. This is what heterosexuals do, fellas. <laughs> 
Green was allegedly a controlling and abusive husband. Feminist Andrea Dworkin claims, Green manipulated Bryant with a cruelty nearly unmatched in modern love stories. And Anita rationalized the abuse, saying, Despite our sometimes violent scraps, I love him for it. But while submitting to her husband and raising four children, Anita was still able to build the career she'd always wanted. By the 1970s, she was on the payroll of Big Orange Juice, earning half a million dollars a year, enough to move her family into a 27-room Spanish mansion on Biscayne Bay. So Anita Bryant struggled all her life for her success. Did she really deserve to lose it all? I wonder what that translates into, into in current dollars. Just because she took a stand for something she believed in? Anita Bryant's role as a leader in the campaign against homosexuality may be hurting her campaign to sell orange juice. Are you being blackballed? Well, it's, uh, it's, it looks that way. It's, it's worse than that. We're being threatened, and uh, there's all kinds of harassment, even with my job with Florida Citrus. Her entire life had become a series of catastrophes. She'd been dropped as spokesperson by the orange growers, she had been dropped as a commentator on the Orange Bowl Parade. She lost a television show contract. Her bookings dropped drastically. Except the gay ones. No one has paid as dearly as Nita Bryant for taking a public stand on something she believed in. I remember lying in the bed in my, my mother's house in a fetal position and wanting to die. Gay activists in the 1970s didn't exactly limit their tactics to polite debate in the free marketplace of ideas. Stop Anita now! Stop Anita now! Stop Anita now! Homosexuals started fighting back. The gays formed new groups and picketed the performer's public appearances, forcing her to cancel a few. Gay activists routinely compared Anita to Adolf H. They created pastiches of her orange juice slogan. They blamed her for hate crimes. They burned her in effigy. They disrupted events she was involved in. They printed toilet paper with her face on it. Some sent Anita death threats, or they mailed her rotting oranges, dead cockroaches, human excrement. See, this is how you canceled people before phones. Instead of shit posting, you would simply mail actual human shit through the United States Postal Service. Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night. <laughs> Anita's husband pleaded to supporters. How would you men feel if you opened a letter and there was a photo of your wife's head superimposed on some other female nude body in the most lewd and shocking sexual act you can imagine? can imagine quite a lot. I do think it would be fair to say that a lot of the rhetoric did take on a misogynistic tone. Lillian Faderman recounts that lesbians, particularly lesbian feminists, abhorred the sexist terms that were being used to characterize Anita Bryant. Bitch and whore, gay men called her. The harassment escalated to the point where Anita had to cancel her book tour due to demonstrations and bomb threats from gay activists. And of course, there was the pie. Oh, oh. So much for the tolerant Mattachine society. It's kind of a deep cut. Well, something to entertain the boomer queers. Gay activists claimed to stand for human rights, but what about Anita's right to free speech? I wish I had some literal pearls to clutch. Civil libertarian Nat Hentoff wrote in his 1992 book, Free Speech for Me, But Not for Thee, that the orange juice boycott reminded him of a little thing called McCarthyism. So here's the here's the rub with that. Um, there's two angles of approach, and once again, uh, this is a weakness of the liberal framework that it can only judge fairness or correctness by reference to impartiality on paper. So formal impartiality, it can't actually judge actual impartiality. So we're talking about a media figure. Um, who is only being quote-unquote canceled precisely because she has a voice uh, <clears throat> monumentally greater than any of her peers or the vast majority, maybe all of the people she's targeting. Um, and so there's two things going on. Um, the nature of her rhetoric is to actually use cultural resources to deperson um, the people that she is targeting and there's a there's a term uh, there's a um, there's a thing in speech act theory that originates with uh, Austin um, 
where we consider a speech act to be either felicitous or non-felicitous. And this becomes actually pretty important. So, um, you may, for example, have the legal right to speak in any venue in public, to say whatever you want. However, um, it may be the case that the culture is so oriented that what you say, given your identity, um, simply does not get taken up as, as what you are saying. Um, your speech is non-felicitous. So here's, here's an example. Uh, if I say I do to you in the audience, I have not therefore married all of you. I'm sorry. I know I, I hate to, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. You will, your heart will mend in time, I promise you. Um, but, uh, in the context of a wedding ceremony, quite possibly it may actually work. Not with all of you. We'll have to be a little bit narrower. We're not that progressive yet. Um, but that's the difference between a felicitous and an unfelicitous speech act. They're both the same. Same language. I do. I do. However, in one case it works. It performs the speech act of marrying. In the other case it doesn't. Similarly, you can have a legal right to free speech. However, if uh, a, a culture is, is so saturated with contempt for your identity that you can't that, that it will not uh, pay attention to your needs or, or enter them into the calculus of, of like legal deliberations um, or policy or anything of that sort, then your free speech, quote-unquote, isn't really free speech. It's just the ability to grunt in a way that sort of resembles speech because you can't actually speak at all. Um, case in point, even Anita's complaints after the fact even in this video, have uh, Contra's ear more than those of the people she was directly targeting. She has more of a voice. Um, people can still hear her and disagree with her, whereas the people Anita Bryan is targeting, uh, she was casting them as degenerates and abominations and such. You don't rate the opinion of a degenerate or an abomination the way you rate the opinion of an upstanding member of society. Have you ever considered that being pro-gay is quite similar to being anti-gay in that both are opinions? As Anita tells it, she and her foot soldiers of God were the victims of sinister gay carpetbaggers. The foot soldiers were housewives and mothers, religious and civic leaders in opposition to a well-organized, highly financed, and politically militant group of homosexual activists. We were cast as bigots, haters, discriminators, and deniers of basic human rights. And all of this happened because we were sincerely concerned for our children and our community. So Anita's version of the story is that she and a handful of well-intentioned Christian mothers were cast as bigots. How many people lost jobs or families because of Anita? Indeed. Um, I, uh, I remember I remember as a kid, we would, we would watch, uh, like, Fox News all the time. I didn't know any better. Um, we would watch, like, Glenn Beck break down into tears because of Soros undermining the West and the dark future facing us all. Um, and as I got more educated, I remember having, like, really serious arguments with family members about, like, political stuff. Um, and because of the, the nature of the material everybody was absorbing, um, those conversations, despite dealing with stuff that was often very abstract and very distant from home, attitudes towards people in the Middle East, things like that, um, they became extremely frictive very fast. Now imagine uh, you're, ha you're in that kind of dynamic, but uh, you're coming out as um, one of the people who was directly targeted by that rhetoric. Your, the response by your family is going to be existential horror and with the best, with what they think, are the best motivated intentions, which is the worst part because it means they will not let up. Um, they will uh, attack your expression of your self-identity um, viciously and relentlessly. And at the point where they can't handle it, they'll throw you out. Um, and it's, it's the tragedy of it is to a certain extent, 
you almost can't blame them in particular because they've been abused and manipulated into that position. It doesn't matter. Um, but like someone like Anita Bryant caused that to happen to a number of people we can never tell. Maybe she still does to this day. Um, this media still exists. People are no doubt fishing for the stuff when they are made uncomfortable by um, modern attitudes towards uh, sex and gender. Like, the, the damage that this does is, is incalculable and might be permanent. It certainly was for a lot of people individually. By a highly funded mafia of gay extremists, all because they had a few teensy tiny concerns about the militant homosexual cavorting with little boys. Cavorting with little boys. Is it really fair to call this woman a bigot? Until the Dade County Ordinance, Anita was a registered Democrat and considered herself a liberal. And she never said that she hated gay people or wanted them dead. In fact, she even said that she loves homosexuals. I love homosexuals. If you can believe that, I love them enough to tell them the truth because I know that there is hope for the homosexuals that if they're willing to uh, turn from uh, sin the same as any individual, that, uh, that they can be ex-homosexual. Here's something. If, uh, if you have a family member who has the position of Anita Bryant, and for the sake of keeping you in their lives, they are willing to respect your identity despite the fact that they are still of a mind that, well, they're still of that same perspective, but they're willing to shut up, not talk behind your back with other family members, and treat you with respect as if they they believe you in public. Um, that takes, that takes love to do. Um, this is a post hoc justification, like it's still, like all, all the problems associated with that besides, and the backwardness of the position, and the arrogance associated with, with holding it. Um, from experience, from people I've dealt with, from my own development, that takes actual like commitment to a relationship to achieve. It's extremely, um, it's extremely disturbing for a lot of people who have been brought up in environments where they have these pathological associations with these things. That's not nothing. That actually does. That's a that's a st that's a big step for a lot of people. And being willing to do that means that at the end of the day, regardless of however they've construed these things ideologically, they chose the person they care about over their sense of comfort and rightness, which is big. Um, what Anita's doing is post hoc justifying hateful behavior by saying, well, technically, uh, uh, ultimately, biblically, <laughs> if people have watched the channel for the last couple of months, you'll know what I'm referring to. Um, no, actually, I, I, I'm loving the person by telling them how disgusting they are and advocating for their depersoning in society. That's not what that is. That's, that's the exact opposite. So it's the same as there can be an ex-murderer, an ex-thief, or ex-anybody. She loves homosexuals because they can change, just like murderers. Would a bigot have said that? <laughs> just about McFucking had it. Anita was so kind-hearted, she even said that she related to the homosexual. I can relate to the homosexual because I've had emotional scars in my own life. I really felt the rejection of my father, and that is one of the things that maybe leads someone going into homosexuality. Look, I don't hate homosexuals. That's the truth, no matter what they think of my motive. I've always said I love the sinner, but I hate the sin. There we wow. go. What an empath. Somebody asked in the chat, is she doing a love the sinner, hate the sin thing? Yes. Yes, she is. You know, I actually think it's really noble how she's able to project all of her own emotional baggage onto the marginalized group whose rights she's trying to take away. Okay. So we've given a fair hearing to both sides, to many sides. We've considered all the evidence. Now, let's suppose there's no longer a gun to my head and ask, did Anita Bryant really deserve that pie to the face? Well, yes, obviously. Look, the point I'm trying to make here is that it's possible to take genuine virtues like nuance, 
empathy and impartiality and to twist them into fucked up apologia for horrible oppressive behavior. If you play this game long enough, you can essentially explain away the entire concept of bigotry okay, here we and go. conclude that, in reality, there are no bigots. There's only tragically misunderstood people with difficult childhoods and valid concerns cruelly demonized by militant activists defaming and silencing them with such reputation ruining slurs as homophobe. Now, because you, viewers, are smart, mm -hmm. media literate people, you understand framing. So you already know that I'm about to compare Anita Bryant to J.K. Rowling. In case you didn't know, J.K. Rowling, uh, Rowling is a popular author who used to write whimsical stories about wizard school, but who now writes books about transvestite serial killers masturbating into stolen panties because she's lost her goddamn mind. Lo ho ho, dear readers. <sighs> Christ, what a nightmare. Chapter three, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. All right, kids. It's trans in time. Last year, I agreed to be a guest on a podcast about J.K. Rowling, hosted by Megan Phelps Roper, an escapee from the Westboro Baptist Church, the notorious hate group from Topeka, Kansas, most known for protesting the funerals of soldiers with signs that say God hates f God and me both, I'm tired of you people. JK Illy. The Westboro Baptist Church is one of the most famous homophobic hate groups in the world. In a way, I'm like a lifelong fan of these people. I've watched all the Louis Theroux documentaries. Judging by her voice here, she legitimately was drunk when she filmed this part and I approve wholeheartedly. I went to a counter protest in 2010. I remember how when I was in high school, the Westboro Baptist Church was like the one thing that conservatives and liberals could agree on because they hated the troops and the gays. Essentially the two genders of 2006. But let's not pretend that the Westboro Baptist Church is all bad. Okay, when Megan was at Westboro, she used to do these amazing Lady Gaga parodies about how the gays are going to hell, which to this day, I am a big fan of. But what did you say you think I love your brain? He hates all you do cause you love fornicating. Love fornicating. It's perfect. I love it. Play it at my funeral. Stop praying, stop praying. I will not hear you anymore. You got the boys and the girls to be proud of. For, for, forever burn. Go with the spawn. You just keep pushing on to the hell where you will forever burn. Megan left the Westboro Baptist Church in 2012 after a crisis of faith precipitated by a power struggle within the church. She wrote about all this in her book Unfollow, which is honestly a pretty interesting account of deconversion and the circumstances that lead someone to leaving a hate group. Megan contacted me for her podcast because I had criticized J.K. Rowling in a video a couple years ago. Now you may be wondering, why would I think that a person who's been carrying a God hates sign most of her life would be the correct person to lead an international conversation about the intricacies of LGBT issues. Because I'm an idiot. Happy? Basically, I agreed to the podcast because it's a pretty irresistible pitch. A former member of the Westboro Baptist Church wants to mediate a conversation between me and the author of Harry Potter. Would you say no to that? Maybe. If you're smart. Last month, the podcast was announced in an essay by Megan titled The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. Obviously a tendentious framing that posits Joe Rowe as the target of an irrational trans witch hunt. The essay included a teaser quote from Rowling complaining that she's been profoundly misunderstood, as well as a photo of an angry trans mob holding a rotten hell rolling sign, juxtaposed with an image of conservative Christians burning Harry Potter books in the early 2000s. This did not bode well. So I disavowed the podcast on Twitter because I didn't want my name lending legitimacy to some kind of Did she give the interview? I can't, I can't remember. Or did she just agree? 
legitimacy to some kind of unearned J.K. Rowling redemption tour. This caused Megan's mom, Shirley, to quote tweet me, calling me a bigot against God. TMW by a bigot against God, failing to accept the fact that God will not change. You will come under the yoke or you will spend your life. Oh, this is Shirley Phelps. Interesting. If anyone's seen, seen uh, Shirley Phelps on camera before, you will believe demons are real for the brief period after you watch it. I mean, God is one of the most vulnerable minorities. There's only one of him. She did do the interview? Let's see. If someone has a, a link to that, send it to me because I'd like to watch it on stream. And he could really use your help, surely. I said in these tweets that I felt used, which that is how I felt, but ultimately I need to take full responsibility for my involvement in this. The thing about being a guest on a documentary like this is you honestly have no idea what the final product is gonna be like. So the decision to participate is always a leap of faith. And I can't really say that Megan misled me. There are red flags from the beginning and I ignored them because I was projecting my own hopes onto the situation. You know, it's a compelling story. I liked the idea that this famous former bigot could talk some sense into a famous current bigot. We all love a good redemption arc. And I started my career de-radicalizing the alt-right. That's something I've moved away from, but there's still part where do I send? In the Discord server, there should be an updated link in the description. ...of me that wants to see the best in people, and to believe that people can change if you just talk to them and make a good enough argument. Maybe my wishful thinking was that because Megan left Westboro, that must mean that she must understand the intricacies of anti-LGBT bigotry, right? And despite no evidence for this, my hope was that Megan would act as a trans ally and could be really effective at confronting Joe Rowe about all the transphobic stuff she says, right? Wrong. I'm Megan Phelps Roper, and these are the witch trials of JK Rowling. The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling is more than seven hours of apologetics for J.K.R. The podcast presents Rowling as a complex, humane, heroic figure with an inspiring feminist backstory. Joe Rowling's rise to success is this sort of feminist Cinderella story. Now cruelly besieged by a vicious mob of transgender activists, <laughs> all because she, as a woman, had a few tiny concerns about the transgender rapist. Okay. I found it. It's an hour and 13 minutes long. I have a feeling we'll understand the tenor of it fairly quickly. I'm going to run to the washroom, and then we will continue with this. So uh, chill out and chat. And um, if you appreciate what I do, uh, there's a Patreon link in the description. I rely on that. That makes everything run. Um, or consider super chatting, and I'll read out your comments. I'll be right back.
Thank you much, Shai Hulud, for the American $49.99. Much appreciated. Pay up, suckas. I would say I disagree, but we are all squids here, and so we are indeed technically all suckas. It's just how it do. We'll give people a minute to come back. And then we'll press on. I once got banned from chat for suggesting that Haiti is not like Japan due to some qualities of the inhabitants of Haiti. Uh... Yeah, I can see why you would be. Behave, we have strict standards here. All right, time to press on. I had been becoming increasingly concerned about the way in which women were being shut down. Women who I felt had some very valid concerns. Megan uncritically accepts Rowling's framing of the conflict as feminists versus trans rights activists, whom Rowling describes as a powerful, insidious, misogynistic movement. For the first five hours of this podcast, Rowling's critics are presented as an irrational mob of enraged, shrieking, sexually violent fanatics. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, you're right. Look at that. Why is that so blurry? It's not blurry on my end. Is there a filter on? Doesn't look like it. Hang on, let me, uh, let me check here. What's happening on with the output? Video bit rate's high. I have no idea. Ever since the last couple of updates, OBS has been absolutely bizarre. You are murdering trans children! Let's get out my time! A huge amount of, I want her to choke on my fat trans dick. And you did it at my birthday dinner. There's this one clip of some kind of Antifa super soldiers abrasive screaming that they play like once per episode. Fuck you, you ugly piece of shit. You look like you got your teeth knocked out, you fucking fascist. Nobody knows who you are and nobody cares and you will die alone. Fuck you, you ugly piece of shit. And then it usually cuts to like somber monks chanting some kind of medieval lament. You will die alone and you will burn in hell. Just in case you didn't get from the title that this is a witch hunt. Do you guys get it? Do you get it yet? You got your teeth knocked out, you fucking fascist! Get out my time! And then these mobs of irrational, misogynistic, trans rights fanatics are contrasted with this poignant story of how J.K. Rowling escaped her abusive husband to publish our generation's most beloved novels. I was still very committed to those parts that I'd plotted in darkness, as it were, because there was a truth to them and there was a power to them. The only voices of genuine trans descent appear in episode six out of seven, more than five hours in. And there's only two of us. One is me, shame, and the other is a teenager named Noah who kind of just seems like he wants to be liked and understood and wishes that his favorite author would please stop saying bigoted things about him. I'm such a big Harry Potter fan, or I was such a big Harry Potter fan, especially because it was so hard to be in the real world. I can't even state how important it was to me. J.K. Rowling, I stole her biography from my third grade classroom and I kept it for a long time because I just loved reading it because I just admired her so much. It's honestly pretty heartbreaking to lose. That's actually, yeah, that's not, that does not leave good feels. 
Um, it's strange too, like the 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 issuesome elements of Rowling's world building, notwithstanding. Um, especially when you're like as sophisticated as as like a middle school or high school child, and you're reading these as as maybe like the first you know novel series you've actually ever read. Um, and the values that the books seem to have, uh, when this like becomes your escape or this becomes like a really central part, a really central and sentimental part of your childhood, that's got to be crushing to find out that the author of that just absolutely categorically hates you with a, a mad, irrational fury. Um, Orson Scott Card, similar deal. Uh, it's actually kind of astonishing with Orson Scott Card because his books would indicate that, you know, he knows better. To a degree that Rowling's don't. But, no. Listen to... On my last day editing this video, I got in touch with Noah. I asked him if he had any thoughts about the podcast he wanted me to pass along, and this is what he said. I want to emphasize that the stakes of this issue are very different from any sort of rhetorical debate. Conversation, dialogue, and debate are important, but for many of the most vulnerable people in society, the outcome of this conversation dictates their health, well-being, and ability to survive. How we treat or talk to people like J.K. Rowling should come second to fighting for maintained access to health care, support, and general resources for children and adolescents seeking gender care. This is actually a really good point. Um, and additionally to this, J.K. Rowling has orders of magnitude more of a voice than this person despite being nowhere near as sophisticated, despite spending nowhere near as much time having thought through her beliefs clearly. Um, and uh, in the name of free speech, a person who is already dominating the public space is able to shut down her critics uh, in the process of attempting to deperson an entire category of her fellow citizens and citizens of countries abroad. Um, it's, it's deeply perverse. I agree. The most frustrating thing about this podcast is that it refuses to be honest about what it is. They spend seven hours implying- This is a really good video so far. I was uh, expecting the worst. I'm pleasantly surprised. ...that J.K. Rowling is the victim of a witch hunt in the most heavy-handed way imaginable. These are the witch trials of J.K. Rowling. I mean, turf is basically witch. But if you point this out, they just <laughs> deny it. Show me the actual words, Jack. Show me where I said I'm the victim of a witch hunt by trans people. You're on a podcast called The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. Yes, a podcast on which I never once say mm. I'm a victim of a witch hunt by <laughs> trans people. What are you talking about? I'm not scamming- Sorry, this hit me harder than I thought, and that just hit me funny. The government, if that's what you're saying. Your license plate says scamming. Uh, no. What do you mean, no? Yes. Joanne, show me where I ever said that I'm the target of a witch hunt, you liar. Why would you even think that? You're crazy. By the way, come get your This Witch Doesn't Burn t-shirt or sale now at Wild Woman Workshop. And Megan is not much better. Like there's this whole section in episode two where Megan interviews Christians who burned Harry Potter books in the 1990s. And this is obviously meant to be foreshadowing. So looking back, would you say that the Christian parents were maybe part of a moral panic? Yeah, absolutely. It's a scary world out there. Megan doesn't explicitly say she thinks trans protests against Joe Rowe are equivalent to the Christian ones in the 90s, but she does heavily imply it. There was an explosive reaction to Rowling's tweets, which led many, including lifelong fans of her work, to condemn her. And See, if I was someone like Megan Phelps Roper and that was my background, I would have thought twice about this, you know? Like a little bit. I'd be a little bit humble about, you know, like my, my intuitive grasp on, uh, on complicated moral issues like this. Um, damn shame. Call for her books to be banned, boycotted, and in some cases, burned. When confronted about the obvious implications of the podcast's title, Megan said, the title is ambiguous. Toward the end of our conversation, okay. I spent a long time talking with... By the way, 
Symbolic book burning is neither here nor there. It's not important. It doesn't matter. Okay, it's stupid, but it doesn't matter. The reason... <laughs> The issue with those photos of the Nazi book burnings that you saw, besides the fact that what was motivating them was, uh, you know, not retaliation against uh, a celebrity, hate-mongering against a vulnerable group of people. Um, in point of fact, one of the, um, a, a ton of resources specifically on what would be, come to be understood as trans issues were burned in the process. Um, these were one-of-a-kind materials. This was actually, like, uh, important material that was destroyed um there isn't especially in the age of the internet it just doesn't have that effect it just doesn't look here i've got a copy of the great transformation by carl polyani uh you know what polanyi i keep saying polyani polanyi um if i burn this tomorrow just because i hate the name carl so much nothing would happen nothing if i bought a hundred of these nothing would happen if I bought every solid copy in the world and burned them, nothing would happen. It's on database. It could be printed off at will. Um, the tear jerking about, oh my god, they burnt the Half-Blood Prince is just... It doesn't actually land as hard... Well, it does, unfortunately. But it shouldn't, it shouldn't land that hard. <laughs> um... You, you shouldn't, uh, like a Holocaust denier should not be whinging because some random people, uh, uh, publicly desecrated his, his books. That's, it's just, it's silly. It's silly. As, as, a uh, as somebody who values books tremendously, I think that's an uncontroversial statement to say about myself. Um, that is not material that is that is incredibly irrelevant jk rolling about discernment about how a person can ever know if they're standing up for what's right or joining a moral panic i think you'll be surprised by the thoughts she shares megan i was not surprised i know i won't ever regret having stood up on this issue ever the podcast released new episodes weekly, and whenever Megan was challenged about the blatant one-sidedness, Megan would respond, Oh, you just think that because you haven't listened to the whole podcast yet, maybe you should preserve judgment. Much more of other perspectives is coming. Make sure to tune in next week. More bombshell revelations to come. Well, I've listened to the whole podcast now, and I truly do not think that anyone with basic media comprehension skills could come away from this thinking that the main intent was anything other than to portray J.K. Rowling as the martyr of an unjust, uh, what's the word? Witch hunt? This is the obvious implication of the podcast from the first words to the very last. And of course, Rowling does literally get the last word. The okay, so we got a lot of video to go left and that glass of absinthe that's looking a little low let's keep an eye on that to see if it refills because these are this is this is cut final episode concludes with this there are more important things in this world good absinthe is really good by the way than being popular and that doesn't mean it's more important to me to be right it means it's more important to me to do the right thing why would you end on that note why would anything about this podcast be the way it is if Megan didn't fundamentally believe that J.K. Rowling is in the right? I don't regret it because I did the right thing. Like, there really is no other reasonable way to interpret this. So, I wish that she would just be honest. If you believe that J.K. Rowling is the misunderstood victim of a witch hunt, then just say that. Make the argument you want to make. Don't crouch and hide behind this disavowal, this obfuscating veil of just asking questions. Don't rely on innuendo and framing and lacrimose Gregorian chanting to make your point while coyly denying you have any kind of agenda beyond, I just believe in conversation. I don't know, I just find this a slippery and dishonest way to argue, but if you happen to be a fan of slippery and dishonest arguments, you're in luck because there is more where that came from.
This video is sponsored by Cannabox. Cannabox offers fresh human meat delivered directly to your doorstep. As an alphabet mafiosa, sometimes I just can't fit the most dangerous- This joke is classist because some of us would literally advertise this. This game into my busy lifestyle of destroying the family and recruiting children. Whenever a new box arrives, I get out my copy of Bless This Food, the Anita Bryant family cookbook. The best thing about human meat delivered to your home by mail in the dead of night? You don't know who you're eating, so it's totally guilt-free and ethically sourced. Maybe. There's no ethical consumption under capitalism. That means you're not allowed to cancel me. Chapter 4. Hang on. I want to see this, uh... I want to see this podcast quickly. So this is the one that Natalie appeared on with, uh, Noah. Hello, dear listener. Hello. I'm Megan, host of this series. And before we get into the show, I wanted to take a minute to tell you about our sponsor, FIRE, the Foundation for up? Individual Rights and Expression. We live in a moment when free speech, the bedrock of our democracy and of oh all free God. societies, is often viewed as suspect, where many argue that the right to free speech is too dangerous and that even listening to oh, ideological opponents is morally wrong. Many people just Kira Rowling, unfortunately, because the comments that she's made, I don't agree with. Hang on, let's Afraid see. to say what we really think. Sometimes even that's why a culture of free strenuously disagree with. One of the things I, I've been asking people about, kind of the elephant in the room, so to speak, is the author, J.K. Rowling. Has your relationship to J.K. Rowling changed since the early days? I don't really care for J.K. Rowling, unfortunately, because the comments that she's made, I don't agree with. It's really sad, actually, because she seemed so progressive. The Harry Potter books, like, when we were kids, they seemed progressive. I think to have the author of these beautiful, loving, accepting <clears throat> stories hurting marginalized communities, it sucks. Yeah, she's super transphobic. She's a turf. She's pretty terrible. Cynical, too. There's no indication whatsoever in any of the Harry Potter books that Dumbledore is gay. Just all of a sudden he is and Hermione is black as soon as there's, uh, you know, public benefit in doing so. It's gross. It's gross. I really wish this was not the hill she chose to die on. Someone like her, she really is just truly at the heart, bigoted, hiding in this, you know, sheep's costume, pretending that she is an ally. <laughs> As I have been working on this series, the accusation that's come up over and over again is that J.K. Rowling is a transphobe and a bigot. In fact, last year at LeakyCon, a Harry Potter fan convention, staff took the accusation so seriously that at one point, they announced that attendees should report anyone who was vocally supporting Rowling in any way, saying, quote, we have zero tolerance for transphobia and bigotry of any kind. For many people who support Rowling, they say that these accusations are so off base that they can be dismissed out of hand. But for me, bigotry is not an accusation that I can take lightly. And that's because- Actually, you really, <laughs> you really should take that lightly because once again, you are part of the God Hates Efsler Church and you should probably have a little bit of humility about this kind of topic in particular. Just... For a long time, I was a notorious bigot. The Westboro Baptist Church is known for picketing the funerals of U.S. soldiers and Marines in protest over what the church sees as the ills of American society. The Westboro Baptist Church is one of America's most notorious religious hate groups. From the time I was five years old, I could be found almost every day protesting. All right, I don't care. We know your story. It's boring. This numbers. And these attacks only furthered our feelings that we... Okay, where... Along with a... Where's the guests coming in? I don't want to hear you. The there we go. Fact. Why is everyone so mad at me? A fact can't be bigoted. And I agree that a fact cannot be bigoted. But a fact on its own doesn't mean very much. Usually when we discuss facts, 
We're using those facts to tell a story. And facts can be used to tell bigoted stories. You know, suppose someone... This was, I think, one of the hardest parts of your critique to consume because of just my own understanding of how important doubts are and how important open dialogue is. Obviously, because of it, that being the, you know, most transformative thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I just wanted to ask you to help me understand where you're coming from. So one critique you made clear in the video, seeing it as the coded language of indirect bigotry is the danger of people who say that they're just asking questions. And I I totally see what you're talking about because there are for sure bad actors and also just people with really bad ideas. And all these people online who make their whole careers out of using the just asking questions idea as a smokescreen, essentially, right? But there are a lot of people, and I've met many of them while working on this project, who just genuinely have a lot of questions. And sometimes they're afraid to ask them. And I, I think asking tough questions and pulling apart arguments is, you know, it's obviously a cornerstone of reasoning. And it's actually a thing that you do so well on your YouTube channel. So I just wonder, you know, like, why is it that you see Rowling and other people in this debate? Why do you see that as, as if they're just like clearly trying to disguise bad intentions? I don't necessarily see it as just trying to disguise bad intentions. I think my I'm less concerned with the intentions than I am with the consequences. And when you have someone who is as influential as J.K. Rowling posing ignorant, loaded questions on Twitter, like this is not the acceptable forum for that level of discourse, right? So, okay, yes, there's very complicated questions that are legitimate to be asked, but I feel like... I don't know, if you're going to be someone with a huge platform who wants to like pose these questions, you kind of have to be responsible for the way that you go about doing that. If you do it in a way that's harmful to trans people, as I consider it beyond any question that the way JK Rowling has done it has been harmful, then I think it's valid for people to be upset with you and to criticize that. Is it that you believe that it's dangerous to ask the questions or just that you don't trust that she's actually engaging in good faith? It's Both. primarily that I don't trust that she's engaging in good faith. I've never really gotten the impression that she wants to know more about the experiences of trans people or from the way that these questions are posed. It's all about, isn't this dangerous to all of the rest of us, right? Aren't these people posing a threat to us? This, yeah, the, I get what she's saying, but the, the phrasing is poor, right? So what she really needs to front and center is not Twitter is the inappropriate venue for this conversation. What she needs to do is front and center that this is a person with a massive audience against whom no trans person has any hope of actually answering commensurately, um, whose uh, statements are directly contributing to the mass deprivation of trans people's rights and their dignity in public and all of the harms that accrue therefrom. That's what she needed, to, not phrase like that, God, but like that. that's the kind of argument she needed to make. I think talking about how like because it sounds snobby, but it's the, the argument that she's making isn't snobby. It sounds like she's saying this is this is beneath this, or this is like, you know, we need the dreaded word, this is irresponsible, but that's not going to have uptake amongst the general audience. So rhetorically, this is a bad decision, but the argument is more than sound. It's just frustrating. So it happens when your, uh, your political opponents are evil idiots, as they always will be, if you're on the right side. Isn't this dangerous to children? Like... On this issue. I see that as a very loaded question. Right, so you're saying it's not the text, but the subtext, in other words. Uh, yeah, completely. Do you think there's any validity to the concerns that she's raised about the possibility of rushed care? There is a small minority of trans people who detransition. And many of these people do kind of cite that trans identity for them was some kind of shelter from other issues going on. So the problem is that she was making herself into a tool of reactionaries? No, that's an additional problem. That's one of the things, though, that will make uh, her rhetoric have potentially very serious effects besides just, you know, um, encouraging uh, bad and ignorant attitudes towards trans people. It's okay to be a snob. Most people are stupid. It's not okay to look like a snob. Looking like a snob is stupid. That makes it so people don't listen to what you're saying. 
on in their life. But the idea- People would rather be wrong than concede to a snob. The idea that trans care is rushed is something that probably is pretty grating to most tr trans people to hear because most trans people have this experience of sometimes years long waiting lists to get care, of having to jump through all these hoops, of having to answer sort of invasive questions about, you know, why you're transitioning and so on, you know, have to having to really fight, in other words, for care. So the idea that, oh, we're just throwing any teenager who plays with the wrong type of toys into the, the transition pipeline, that's just not happening. Probably some people are getting sloppy care because that's generally a problem with healthcare in the US and the UK. The, the medical infrastructure is actually not that great. But I feel that this is being presented as a bigger problem than it in fact is, which is not to minimize like that. Obviously, it's very painful if you transition and then realize that you've made a mistake, but it just doesn't happen that often. Mm -hmm. So is your issue on the possibility of trans children transitioning being rushed in some cases is that you and Rowling don't necessarily have a totally different point of view, but more about what she's choosing to focus on. Well, no one wants to rush teenagers into transitioning if that's not what's going to be the best outcome for them, right? I just feel that a lot of the kind of moral panic over this is overstated. It sounds like you think that she's exaggerating the risks and that adds to a climate of fear around something that society still seems hesitant to embrace. Yeah. When I was talking to Natalie about this idea of exaggerating real risks in a way that might distort them, I asked her if she felt the same way about Rowling's concerns around self-ID and... This is commentary on the original conversation. Was the original conversation actually released or was this just how it was released with her embellishments on top? That's slimy if that's what she did. Gender recognition certificates and what they could mean for single sex spaces. I mean, first of all, she says, you know, there's this fear, oh, men are just going to be able to come barging into bathrooms with those certificates. Do you need a certificate to enter a bathroom now? That's not how bathrooms work. Like, to me, this is a sort of imagined fear-generated scenario that doesn't really line up with the actual experience of people in bathrooms, right? People identify your gender based on how you look. I mean, I've been using women's bathrooms for five years no one has ever approached me about it, mm -hmm. right? So cr generating a paranoia about men in women's bathrooms is sort of this purely imaginative scenario where, you know, there's going to be perverts in bathrooms who have, will face no consequences because of, like, I don't know, sexual assault is still illegal. It's not really clear to me how much protection a certificate mm -hmm. gives someone. When you talk about the danger of the, like, asking questions idea or, or seeing it as indirect bigotry... Mm -hmm. An interesting aspect of this part of it is that, you know, in the first chapter of the first Harry Potter book, Uncle Vernon keeps yelling at Harry over and over again, stop asking questions. And when I asked Rowling about why she started the book this way, she said that from the start, the book was anti-authoritarian. Uh, and that, she understood, starts when people are discouraged from voicing their doubts. And you are someone who's been vocal about the ways that the Internet has become a place where authoritarian behavior is on the rise. Like, do you see what she's worried about? I think that to be authoritarian, you have to be able to leverage authority. And trans people are in a weak position, right? I don't see the, the, like this trans big brother that you can't question. Like, like that's a very melodramatic and self-pitying way of framing this, that I understand why to people it feels like, oh, the mob is attacking me. Well, okay. Hang on. I want to hear what she says next because she might actually answer what I'm about to say. I don't know, is that, that the, the mob is, is, it can be vicious and unreasonable and unsympathetic and unnuanced. Absolutely. But to me, that's fundamentally different from Big Brother. Okay, that's weak. Um, here's what she needed to say. Uh, yeah, you know what? On the internet, there are a lot of communities in which uh, some people, in some cases based on identity, are able to bully other people out of their spaces, and it's difficult to have, you know, reasonable conversations about things. Especially if you're coming from a cultural or, or personal background where you are not, shall we say, conditioned uh, to engage in a positive and respectful way with trans people or with trans issues. Um, 
And so if you're somebody who is new to the phenomena, um, you can very quickly find yourself uh, in a bunch of very untoward conversations with people who do not really care to educate you so much as to uh, bully you for the brief little span of time they have some level of power over somebody else. That's fair, because that actually is the case, unfortunately. Um, there are a lot of people on the internet who use their, who use like the, 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 the artificiality of the space to feel powerful at the expense of being useful. Or at the expense of impeding people from trying to be useful. And that sucks. But, it doesn't matter. It's the internet. Random people being uh, uncouth um, is, is not... A, a, a tit for tat with a massive celebrity uh, targeting an already embattled minority and and trying to make them seem like uh, perverts and and depraved insane people um, th these aren't commensurate and I think that's really what you needed to hammer in not not that well. You know, you need authority to do that. Because that doesn't, that doesn't ring right. Because immediately the retort is, well, hang on a sec. The mob exercises a kind of authority. And the, uh, the amount of people who have condemned Rowling sort of puts the lie to the idea that there is no authority on the other side. Because there is a little bit. There's not enough to stamp out Rowling. There's not enough to really keep her from, uh, like, like, saying the things that she's been saying and doing the things that she's been doing or to control her in any way. Um, but at the very least, there seems to be some level of at least optical parity, definitely from that perspective. Um, and so this is just going to fall on deaf ears, which is unfortunate. In her J.K. Rowling video... Natalie talks about the way that some trans people wield power online, including why that power is sometimes wielded so fiercely. A lot of extremely online trans people really don't have a strong sense of conviction in their own identity, which is why they need constant external validation to prop them up. They need to constantly be told that they're valid, that they really are the gender that they say they are. And if someone even obliquely threatens or questions their fragile self-concept, they lash out. And for some of those trans people, canceling celebrities on Twitter is the one kind of power they have. You know, have people been abusive, disproportionate, out of line in reacting against J.K. Rowling? Of course. Do I endorse people saying, like, violent or, or abusive, cruel things? No. I've been the target of, of a lot of that myself, but I also kind of understand what people are mad about. Mm -hmm. I definitely hear you. Um, as, as I'm thinking back, you know, of course, I was out in Westboro when the discussion about... At the end of our conversation... I told Natalie a bit more about my own story, how it was people willing to engage with me, even when I was saying really cruel things that was so transformative, and how I wonder, as uncomfortable as those conversations can be, if they're really the best path to progress that we have. Over the last decade, when it comes to things like opposition to same-sex marriage, so many people have been persuaded and now supported. And I asked her whether one of the reasons she was willing to speak publicly about these issues was because in a pluralistic society, actually having the conversation... Westboro Baptist Church was a universally condemned, or is a universally condemned organization. Um, being a part of it puts you in the line of fire of uh, an endless amount of very just condemnation um, and, and is very socially limiting. I don't believe that it was conversations alone that made this person change her tune on this. Um, I think she wanted to escape the group. I haven't read her book. I don't know her story. But the idea that you would take what removed somebody from Westboro Baptist Church in particular and say that this is an appropriate, uh, this is an appropriate measure to convince a bigoted person who is also a celebrity and indeed celebrated 
by a massive part of the population, far more so than condemn her or criticize her, uh, is, is absurd. It's absurd. Station is how effective change is made. That they serve a purpose that is ultimately good, even though we wish there was a, a, a more ideal route. Well, I think that realistically, that is how acceptance, that is the trajectory. Like, I'm not under any illusions about what it's going to take for trans people to be accepted. I think that we're probably 20 years away. Um, and I think that what it is going to take is people simply habituating to a world that includes trans people. And uh, my guess is that once that happens, once that habituation happens, it becomes much less of this hypothetical, new, scary, invasive thing. And it becomes uh, something that's sort of accepted in life. And th I, that will happen with trans people. Trans people are not going anywhere. You're not going to be able to get rid of President Sunday, in close proximity to this interview, Wynne uh, had herself been dogpiled on Twitter. She was set up by this woman, and she very clear, clearly uh, says she knows that in the vid you started with. Which we're going to go back to as soon as we're done this section. Bit of us, I think that once this becomes normal, it will become, to most people, a bit more of an embarrassment that they behaved in this way um, during these years. And I certainly do believe in having the conversation. I mean, I'm, I consider myself, I think I'm having the conversation right now. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that. Again, I, I just want you to know how much I appreciate that because well, I think I'm, will, I'm willing to have the com conversation because I, f I feel that I often have no choice, mm -hmm. but I that's not absinthe absinthe when properly consumed is loosed, which makes it pearly white. Well, here's the thing though. If she's pouring the absinthe into a glass without intentions to drink it immediately, then she will not put ice cold water into the absinthe to loose it, which will turn into sort of like a milky whitish green color as opposed to just kind of a clear green. So it could still be absinthe. Uh, you know, I also hope that people sort of understand the reason why a lot of trans people might not be super eager to politely answer every question they have about isn't giving you health care dangerous mm -hmm. for children isn't allowing you into bathrooms going to leave women vulnerable to rape like it's, it takes patience to answer these questions and to not feel insulted or attacked i mean i am willing to like do it to a certain extent because i know that i have to right because unfortunately the progress of trans people is in its still fairly early stages mm -hmm. and and i i hope you understand like how deeply I know this in my bones because when I think about the people who engaged me on Twitter uh, back in the day, the ones who were patient and showed me grace when I displayed the kind of absolutely horrible, cruel behavior that I did, uh, it, it honestly shocks me. So anyway, yeah, I, I just, I, I completely um, understand that and I, I appreciate it. I do. I mean, I, some, I do sometimes worry that I'm like somewhat losing my ability to be, to have that kind of like tranquil, forgiving quality because you can get worn down doing this for too long. Um, sometimes I, I worry that I'm, mm -hmm. I guess... I usually, I sort of usually avoid these conversations lately because I, do, I honestly kind of have gotten a bit burnt out on it, but I do still feel this kind of, you know, why am I here? I think JK Rowling, like, you know, she, I read all those books when I was a kid, like it, there's, there's so lingering emotional Like, there's a part of me that actually still cares. Hmm. Sorry. There's a part of me that, that still cares what she thinks, you know? Mm-hmm. What would you want to say to J.K. Rowling? I just kind of hope she could try to see why so many trans people are angry and hurt by this. And 
I realized that that means asking for a second to like leave her own position of feeling hurt and threatened. That's what she says that she wants to do. And to me, what doing that would look like would be understanding why people who are sort of being constantly rejected and humiliated by our families, by the government, who are losing our access to healthcare or being threatened with it, who are kind of just like fighting for a basic ability to participate in society, like why we might feel hurt and betrayed by her sort of contributing to like fear about us. That's, I guess, what I would say. I think she actually did rather well, all things considered. Um, given what Natalie said in this video, and she anticipated that Roper would be a trans advocate and uh, not a disingenuous social parasite trying to play both sides for media clout, which deeply disappointing to learn that. Um, I, I don't think I would have expected her to be prepared for those types of questions, even though she probably should have been anyways. So, not the most rhetorically effective um, thing, but it seemed like a... seemed genuine. So I have trouble faulting her for that one. That one's on a roper. Joe Rose transphobia. That's it! I'm going full Slytherin. In episode five of The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, Joe Rowe compares trans activists to Death Eaters, the fictionalized fascists in Harry Potter. My position is that this activist movement, in the form that it's currently taking, echoes the very thing that I was warning against in Harry Potter. The Death Eaters claim Uh, you mean a, a, a bunch of, uh, purity-obsessed traditionalists, um, spreading hatred against diverse groups, uh, in a vain attempt to reclaim their lost authority and power? Interesting choice. And we have been made to live in secret, and now is our time. I am fighting what I see as a powerful, insidious, misogynistic movement. When an article then claimed she had equated trans people to Death Eaters, the podcast's PR firm reached out demanding a correction because she only equated the movement to Death Eaters, not trans people in general. Yeah, I don't hate marginalized people. I just hate it when they advocate for themselves. So I do have to be very careful with my wording here, lest a defamation letter arrive by owl. JK Rowling's bigotry is exhausting to argue with because she expresses it as an endless series of- That's a good point, Rose. I mean, you know what she could? What she could be concerned about, or not the trans advocates, what she could be concerned about, you know, are the actual white nationalists whose ranks have been swelling in recent years. Uh, some of whom were involved, if memory serves, in a recent attempt to uh, attack actual sitting Congress people of what are called Mott and Bailey arguments. A Mott and Bailey argument is named after a type of castle consisting of a Mott, that is a tower atop a mound or a hill, easy to defend, and a Bailey, a fenced courtyard that's much more vulnerable to attack, difficult mm. to defend. So a Mott and Bailey argument is when someone makes- A delicious liqueur that makes coffee just a little bit better. Makes a provocative claim that's difficult to defend the Bailey. And then, when confronted with counter-arguments, they walk it back to a much less controversial and easy-to-defend version of the claim, the Mott. For example, Rowling will make an ambiguous claim like, sex is real. What does she mean by that? What are the implications? Well, in the podcast, she explains that she thinks it's very sinister that in the Associated Press style guide, it says that instead of referring to a trans woman as a man who identifies as a woman, journalists should simply say a trans woman is a woman. That from the Associated Press is hugely powerful. They've edged from identifies as a woman, so a man identifies as a woman, which, I, and I think we all understand what that means, into 
is a woman, and that's precisely the creep that I'm talking about. We are using language to make accurate definition of sex difference unspeakable. Which is, of course, false because the words trans and cis exist precisely to make it easy to talk about sex difference. Thanks a lot, Tumblr. God, there's this whole section of the podcast that sort of implies that transgender people were invented on Tumblr, which I'm not even gonna get into because we don't have time. Rowling has also tweeted that she thinks that all people who menstruate must be referred one of her goons pulled a literal senator to the ground for approaching them, didn't make the news much because the senator is indigenous. What's this? Oh, the Posey Parker rally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Let's talk about rallying for a second. Yeah. Rowling is treating her kid's book like it's Foucault. <laughs> Referred to as women. Or was it Wumpin? I'm pretty sure it was Wump Mud. So trans men and trans masculine people, Wumbles. they are all women and it must be referred to as women because JK Rowling demands it. This is controversial, right? Calling trans women men who identify as women, calling trans men women. This is the Bailey in her Ma and Bailey argument. Trans women are men, trans men are women. That's the controversial interpretation of sex is real. Now, when accused of transphobia and facing backlash, Rowling walks the argument back and says, I'm being persecuted just for saying that women should be- Here, let's actually, I wanna see this quickly. So, um, so here's the actual footage the that was being, dis police. this is the footage that was being described. While trying to interrupt an anti-trans rights rally in Canada, Holy shit. attended by One Nation- He just picked her right up. Attended by one Look at that. Rally in Canberra, attended by one That's a senator on the ground. By police while trying to interrupt an anti-trans rights rally in Canberra. Be allowed to discuss how being female has shaped our lives. Women should be allowed to discuss how being female has shaped our lives. This one of her security chokes someone out. This is the obvious and utterly uncontroversial interpretation of sex is real, the mot. And virtually every argument sophisticated transphobes make about trans people follows this pattern. JK Rowling's friend and ally, Maya Forstadter, will tweet inflammatory things like, men cannot change into women. But then when she's criticized, she'll say that she's being attacked for gender critical belief. Gender critical belief which is the absolutely ordinary belief about sex, that your mother and your grandmother are women, that being female is a thing. Your mother and grandmother are women. Being female is a thing. That's literally all I'm saying. Your mother and grandmother, depending on their age, well, certainly your grandmother, would have lived in a time when uh, you could be raped by your husband without any uh, crime being committed. But if that's literally all she was saying, then no one would be mad, would they? Nine, nar. Men cannot change into women is the Bailey. Your mom is a woman is the Mott. Your mom's a woman. <laughs> This is why arguing with these people is infuriating. They'll insinuate that trans women are dangerous rapists, exhibitionists, and voyeurs. Then when trans people understandably get mad, they'll say, look, I'm being attacked just for saying that being female is part of my experience. Here's the thing too. Um, and I've noticed this a lot with a bunch of different issues, but this one is, is one of the more uh, bad ones, obviously. Um, the gender sex distinction is not new. And as a conceptual distinction, it's not actually something that you can just bluntly deny as if it's a scientific fact. These are the labels we give to things. Now you can argue, for example, that gender and sex are always aligned. That's an argument you can make. You cannot argue that uh, gender is necessitated by sex without like an actual firm argument linking these two together. Um, and you don't see that happening. Instead, you see an insistence, no, no, uh, you are male gendered if you have a dick, you're female gendered if you have a vagina. That's it. And that's where the argument stops. Um, and this is stupid because it's obviously not answering the challenge that's being posed by the distinction between sex and gender. Because obviously, 
your genital set that you're born with doesn't indicate where you should be slotted into society. It doesn't indicate what vocations are appropriate to you, what forms of dress, etc., etc. Um, and this is known. However, uh, what people have learned, because one of the worst and most perverse parts of our modern condition is that even the, the, the teeming masses um, are now have now made themselves culpable for the same crime as the elites, uh, they have learned that if enough people will just insist upon an interpretation of a thing or insist upon a line, you can bully people out that you don't like, regardless of how unsophisticated or wrong your position is, because that doesn't matter. It's the worship of raw force, which is the grand irony of Rowling. Um, because Rowling would be a Death Eater in a heartbeat in her world. It's dishonest. They talk a bunch of trash about trans people, and then when trans people talk trash back, they pretend that they're being victimized for making totally innocuous statements. We could name this behavior the birthday boy argument. I dated a 5A guy who'd taunt every jacked 6'3 bro he met until they'd pull their fist back to beat him up, whereupon my ex would go, hey, 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 come on, I'm a little guy, I'm just a little guy, no, it's also my birthday, I'm a little birthday boy. And somehow it always worked. So a birthday boy argument is when you make aggressive, inflammatory assertions, followed by, teacher, teacher, look what he's doing to me, when the target reacts with anything less than extreme politeness. Another common tactic you'll see anytime Rowling's transphobia is discussed is you'll see someone jump in to say, show me one thing she's said that's transphobic. For example, Here's someone on Twitter called Large Gamete Producer. It's funny, isn't it, how these people will insist that awkward inclusive language like people who menstruate is horribly oppressive and degrading, but then they'll just straight up call themselves Large Gamete Producer. Which, by the way, is Rowling's definition of a woman. The woman is um, the producer of the large gametes. <laughs> oh, I like it. It's very brood mother. That Rowling's words regularly appear in gender critical arguments shows the massive influence that she has in the anti-trans movement. She's like their queen, their, their, their leader, their, their headmistress. She's the best thing that ever happened to them because Sheila Jeffries certainly wasn't persuading a lot of people. If you know, you know. Large gamete producers says, JK isn't anti-trans, give me just one. What the fuck is a gamete? Uh, she's a weirdo on Twitter. She used to hang around with RGR. One direct quote that she has said, which is anti-trans. Oh, what's that? You can't find one? Well, color me shocked. Imagine. Before we waste our time trying to provide examples, let's take a look at large gamete producer's profile. Trans women are not women, they are men. Trans men are not men, they are women. Nothing can change that. Sex is binary. Like if this person doesn't think that trans women are men, trans men are women, is a transphobic statement, then what would they consider a transphobic statement? This is why the first question you should always ask such people is, do you believe that transphobia is a legitimate concept? What are some examples of statements- Why are people saying happy birthday? It's not my birthday. My birthday's in January. What is this? Did you miss my birthday? You can super chat me now. I'll accept it. I'll forgive you. ...that you would consider transphobic. Because many of them don't believe that transphobia is a valid concept because they don't think that trans people are a legitimate minority. There's no such thing as a trans woman. There's no such thing as a trans person. There is no such thing. There are people... There are no such thing as people. There are no such thing as animals. There's no such thing as anything. I am an illusion. ...call themselves these things that may have other issues manifesting that then make them think they're this but no we have to stop using any words like transgender we have to stop using words no more words there may be more words that we have to say in order to say that we may but that is a necessary evil the end result will be no more words and that is good call it transgender ideology good is expressed with no words Ugh. Uh, but when it comes to a person they may be following transgender ideology, but they are not transgender. There is no such thing as a man or a woman. There's no such thing as gender. There's no such thing as sex. We are all worms. Anything other than a man or a woman. So when they say, worms. show me an example of something transphobic JK Rowling has said. This is a trap. They're just messing with you. There's nothing that she could have said that they would acknowledge as transphobic. 
Now, if you're someone who believes that transphobia is a valid concept and you believe that trans people are a legitimate minority, but you just genuinely are unaware of what JK Rowling has said on the topic, then I will refer you to my past video on JK Rowling's transphobia rather than recapping it all here. <sighs> just keep in mind that she's gotten significantly worse since I made that video. I mean, just look at her Twitter feed. True, she never says the phrase, I hate trans people because she's not a complete idiot, but Anita Bryant never said, I hate gay people. People, she said, save our children. I love homosexuals. For that matter, I'm pretty sure David Duke doesn't say I hate black people, but he will share a lot of statistics about anti-white crime. So this is not really a very good criterion for deciding who's a bigot, is it? What JK Rowling does do is tweet again and again about I'm sleep deprived gender. About transgender rapists, about the danger trans women pose to cis women. She implies that trans inclusive language is equivalent to the dystopia of Orwell's 1984. She writes at length about the vague, nefarious cabal of endocrinologists and ideologues that is supposedly persuaded. Xander Lars, thank you for the $2. There is no such thing as a birther. That is correct. Every day is super chat day. Thank you. Waiting confused vulnerable girls to transition. To quote Washington Post opinion writer Monica Hess, I do not know what is in Rowling's heart, but reading her Twitter feed, this is the overall effect. Probably her gas. Twitter feed does not ask its readers to think. It asks them to fear. It creates phobias of trans people. It creates trans phobias. <laughs> if you will. Rowling has also attacked pro-trans politician Nicola Sturgeon, calling her destroyer of women's rights via a t-shirt she got from anti-trans hate monger Posey Parker. There's no such thing as a trans woman. There's no such thing as a trans person. There is no such thing. If there's one thing that I want people to understand about- There are no things. Rowling's transphobia. It's that this is not- Things are an illusion. There is only things, and those two things to thing them. Not a case of someone posting a couple insensitive tweets that got blown out of proportion. Rowling is an extremely outspoken opponent of trans rights. This has been her main issue for several years now. And because she's so famous, she's become the de facto global champion of backlash to trans rights. Truly the Anita Bryant of transphobia, except worse because she's way more famous and way more liked than Anita Bryant ever was. Rowling has also praised self-described theocratic fascist Matt Walsh for his transphobic propaganda. I remember this. ...to film. She refers to trans women as trans-identified males, known as Tims, among people for whom this has become an unhealthy obsession. She retweets images of the trans colors being erased from the progress flag, also the colors representing queer people of color, so, you know, great. Love that. Often, Rowling pretends that she's being transphobic for the principled and valiant purpose of defending lesbians. It's something of a fixation for her. I find this particularly gross because it plays into the lesbophobic trope that gay women are especially anti-trans, when in fact, they're the least transphobic demographic of cis people. According to a survey of young adults in the UK, lesbians were most likely to know a trans person and also most likely at 96% huh. to say that they're supportive or very supportive of trans people. So I think it's fair to say- Good on you, lesbians. That most gay women are probably not super thrilled whenever Joe Rowe the lesbian defender logs on. My own partner is a cis lesbian and I asked her if she enjoys JK Rowling defending her from the transsexuals and she said, It makes me want to gouge out my eyes like Oedipus. By the way, here is JK Rowling enjoying a bit of banter with her friend Baroness Emma Nicholson, the co-founder of Rowling's charity Lumos. Baroness Nicholson is a conservative member of the House of Lords Oedipus at Colonus is the best ancient Greek play, by the way, and I will fight you on that. Who voted against same-sex marriage in 2013. In 2020, she tweeted in defense of her vote, claiming that gay marriage would lead to degrading the status of women and girls. Truly one of the great lesbian allies. And in 2022, here is JK Rowling joking around with Lady Nicholson. Excellent question, Emma. Defining lesbians as same-sex attracted women excludes and depresses the most marginalized of all groups, i.e. people with penises and beards who want to shag women. And before you say, 
But aren't they straight men? They're wearing eyeliner, Pickett. Try for a moment to put aside any nostalgia you may have for the Gryffindor common room and just look at this interaction for what it is. Two straight- I've got none to be honest. The Gryffindor common room is pretty basic. Slytherin common room is where it's at. Ravenclaw's also okay. A little bit on the cold side though. Women, one of whom is a homophobic peer of the realm, having a nice little chuckle together about how trans women are men wearing eyeliner. So that's it, right? It's over. Case closed. That's good. I still like hammering things. I'm not gonna argue anymore about whether JK Rowling is transphobic because anyone who believes in transphobia can see that obviously she is. The question now is whether transphobia is the sort of thing that progressives can denounce, the way we at least aspire to denounce racism, misogyny, and homophobia. That's usually what we're talking about when we talk about JK- Euripides doesn't hold a candle to Sophocles, I'm sorry. JK Rowling, right? Whether it's fair to cancel her. That's what the witch trials of JK Rowling is about. The Rowling debate is a proxy for a larger question. Is transphobia a legitimate viewpoint worthy of polite consideration and respect in liberal humane society? Or is it just an ugly prejudice that we can justifiably react to with scorn and condemnation? And there's an even broader question here about whether we can justifiably react to anything with scorn and condemnation. Is canceling ever warranted? Is it right to condemn racism, homophobia, and misogyny? Or should we allow spokespeople for these prejudices a respected position in the free marketplace of ideas? Where we can all sit around debating the legitimacy of gay marriage or the possible merits of a white ethnostate? Is the final solution a myth? promulgated by the international Jew? Are yoga pants to blame for sexual violence? Wouldn't the taxpayers save a lot of money if there weren't so many disabled people? Who knows? These are open questions. Let's sit down with people on both sides, on many sides, and have calm, civil conversations about it for the rest of our goddamn lives. Chapter five, debate. Sar, I know I did this look before and it's like not related to the t video topic at all, but it just makes me feel sliving. The boy who slived. So Megan Phelps Roper's viewpoint seems to be that scorn and condemnation are never appropriate. That we should approach every conflict with empathy and compassion, even when dealing with the worst. Back A won first prize in the City of Dionysia Festival. Sorry, in the City of Dionysia Festival. Um, that's the, uh, that is the blue check mark of the ancient world, Pippa. Get wrecked. Most destructive people in the world. Hi, my name is Megan, and my heretical belief is that even the people who seem to be the worst, most destructive people in the world are human beings. Because that describes me, so I'm already, I have a conflict of interest with this, and uh, I'm now marketing myself as a uh, media figure. How about that? What a quinky dink. Who deserve compassion and empathy if we want to find a way to change their minds. In her book, in her TED talk. Never trust someone who weaponizes vocal fry like that. In her public appearances, Megan expresses the idea that society has recently become polarized in some unprecedented way, that we've all become extremists, that in some sense, we've all become the Westboro Baptist Church. I can't help but see in our public discourse so many of the same destructive impulses that ruled my former church. She identifies things like certainty, vilification of compromise, us versus them thinking, suppression of empathy, and celebration of death and misfortune as Westboro-like elements in public discourse. And this really bought- Here, As an example of a type of depersoning, oh, thank you, Rick Sy, for the membership. Um, for an example of depersoning in the other direction, like people on the right, for instance. Because this person escaped the Westboro, Westboro Baptist Church, people now assume that she is incapable of being self-interested, cynical, or guileful, when she's as capable of doing so, in fact, given the nature of uh, the activities in which her church was involved, namely they're all a bunch of lawyers um, who worked under uh, public ire for their entire existence, um, she's probably more equipped to uh, 
for media ma manipulation than most people. Um, this is this is not someone to trifle with. Uh, she's charismatic. She's managed to build herself out of an extremely toxic space. She's managed to spin that to her political advantage. Um, this is not someone who is a minor. This is not someone who is a weak victim um, who should be shown limitless charity and just assume that everything she does is from a place of pure good intentions because it's not how this works. Authors making because she claims that a decade ago when she went on Twitter to tweet about how f marriage is abominable to God, it was people who engaged her in a civil, rational way that eventually led her to renouncing Westboro's ideology. Which is bullshit because you don't actually switch those beliefs through talking about them. Because nobody can have an authoritative response to this is the natural way things ought to, things are as, as God designed them because that's a conversation basically nobody's equipped to have because it requires the person who is espousing the bigoted beliefs to be open to having their deep religious convictions upon which they may have an existential and a material dependency um, as, as, as well as uh, having like the, the internal honesty to both accept those, the loss of that and to uh, entertain for no personal benefit for really no reason at all from where they're standing, um, a line of argumentation that only makes them deeply uncomfortable. That's actually very unlikely. What probably actually happened was she started to feel the weight of the social condemnation that was coming down on, on her church. Um, as a consequence of that, she had a bunch of little social pressures that caused her to adjust how she behaved. And just maybe, if she hasn't been obscuring her actual thoughts... The end result of that was that she became accustomed to treating gay people like people. Maybe. We don't actually know. We can't actually see inside her head. But that's, that's what would have happened. At no point did someone sit down with her and go, I've prepared a treatise for you. I'm going to walk you through the illogicality of your positions. You're going to sit there and listen. Like, when would this conversation have taken place? What kind of conversation could this be? If a single, if a few conversations with one or two people um, were enough to, to achieve this, then the belief she held, she didn't really hold to begin with. Because she put up no resistance. She just allowed her opinion to be changed by the bare fact of somebody else articulating a contrary one. That's not how this works. Nobody changes their mind on something substantial like that through just having a chat with a rando who happens to be playing nice with you at the time. And like, I don't entirely disagree with Megan about this. She's totally right that if you want to change people's minds, then approaching them with compassion and empathy is usually the best way to do that. But Megan reaches another conclusion that I don't agree with, which is that because compassion and civil conversation are most likely to persuade people, we should never cancel anyone even the most horrible bigots. And canceling is a pretty meaningless term at this point. But what Megan means is we shouldn't say mean things to bigots. We shouldn't boycott or counter protest or raise our voices. We shouldn't shun or exclude anyone because that's just not how you change minds. And I get why Megan thinks this, right? De-radicalization was a really important part of her life experience. She's also clearly holding out hope that other members of her family will leave Westboro and have a life on the outside. She has a quote from her mom in her Twitter bio. The last lines of her book address her family. I want to tell them that I- Well, again, in her book, she discusses how she became afraid of the church turning on her, which scared her out of the church. It wasn't talking to people. It was fear of ostracization. Yeah, so it was social pressures. Social pressures from outside, drawing her into a different mode of behavior, and social pressures, apparently from within, um, repelling her from that. And to that point, uh, she is right. Like, if you are engaging in a conversation with someone to the end of persuading them through conversation, then you want to be empathetic and you want to be, like, w patient and willing to have a back and forth and to, like, be gentle with uncouth, to put it very politely, statements that they may make in their relative ignorance. Um, but that's different from a social prescription for being polite at all costs to celebrities in particular who will not return the favor and who will not be punished for it.
Love them. I'll just have to find another way. This is touching and human and also kind of a conflict of interest. The problem is Megan's mm. views about this only make sense if you assume that Megan is the main character of reality. If you assume that the moral improvement of bigots is more important than protecting the that's people- That's something else. Well, that's, that's also true, but that's something else as well. I th thought there was going somewhere else with that. Um, the bare fact that happened to work with her, hers is a remarkably unique situation. Let's assume for argument's sake that that description, whether or not she gives it in her book, um, that she was talked out of her position because people were polite to her on Twitter. Let's assume that that actually worked, that that's what happened. Good for her. That is, that is not a basis for saying, this is how you solve every single social issue. This is how you solve every single case of a bigot with a platform weaponizing that platform to target and battle community. That's, it's silly. It's silly. It's evidenced by nothing. Well, they target. Or if you assume that changing bigots' minds is the only way to make social progress, which it isn't. As far as I know, Anita Bryant is 83 years old and she's still homophobic. But even without Anita's blessing, gay rights have still somehow managed to progress since the 1970s because gay activists didn't need to persuade Anita Bryant. They needed to defeat her. And that's what they did. We have to accept that realistically, persuading all the bigots is just not an option. Yes, we should convince as many people as possible, but there will always be bigots. And mocking them, shaming them, or boycotting them is, I think, a perfectly valid strategy. Does that mean that when we cancel bigots, we're acting kind of like the Westboro Baptist Church? Nar. You would only think that if you're a total moral relativist. I guess controversial opinion, but bigotry is- No, the word you're looking for is idiot. Shameful, and it should be shamed. I'll say it. You know, if you're testing out some racist ideas in your head, you might feel afraid to express them publicly for fear of being shamed or judged. Is that because we live in an Orwellian dystopia that punishes people for wrong think? No, it's because racism is dangerous and shameful and you should be ashamed of it and the people judging you are right to do so. And sure, there are some very patient people who devote their lives to de-radicalizing bigots, which I think is a perfectly noble thing to do. There's a guy named Daryl Davis who's befriended members of the Ku Klux Klan. And he has not ceased to brag about it and it's actually really frustrating. And you will watch him be approached by black people who are like, hey, you're uh, you're making a big name for yourself doing this, but it doesn't appear that you're actually really converting people. Um, it sounds like you're convincing a couple of KKK members who are moderates to be a little bit nicer in public. And then that's that's about it. Um, and then in, in, in connection with that as well, um, being overbearing to other people who don't want to devote the rest of their lives specifically to prying out individually KKK members one by one as if that exhausts um, the issues of, of racism in America today. Like that's, it's, it's obnoxious. For over I wonder if she gets to that. We, we covered him a little while ago. It's, it's actually deeply depressing. 30 years and he claims he's convinced more than 200 of them to leave. And good for him. De-radicalization is a valid strategy, but it cannot be the only strategy, and it must not be the primary strategy. Because we're not going to defeat racism by telling black people to be a little nicer to racists. Feminists would be wasting their time trying to convince Andrew Tate to respect women. In general, I think that the massive effort that it takes to maybe persuade bigots is better spent persuading other people not to listen to them. And it's also worth cautioning that de-radicalization is often a messy and incomplete process. 20-year-old white nationalist Peter Saitanovic became the face of the fascist Unite the Right rally in 2017 when a photo of him mid-scream, tiki torch in hand, was <laughs> That's what that looks like. <laughs> published in news outlets all over the country. 
Peter was unrepentant in interviews he gave immediately after the rally, but he began to question his beliefs after befriending a Muslim woman who, according to Charlotte MacDonald Gibson, challenged his views without insulting him, allowing him to understand the hurt he had caused. Peter is no longer a white nationalist, but that doesn't mean he's flushed out every trace of bigotry. In a 2019 interview with the London School of Economics... It also doesn't mean that's actually what had an effect. People like to... People like to narrativize their own lives and to narrativize, like, the, the relationships they have with others because it makes them feel important. There's no reason to believe this. This is an anecdote by an untrustworthy source. Economics student paper, Peter said, I don't like the whole transgender thing. You're born either a man or a woman. <sighs> So he maybe still has a little bit of work to do. When I did de-radicalization work on YouTube, I used to get some criticism from people of color. Oh, she did? No. Who were not thrilled that I was bringing a bunch of semi-reformed racists over to the left. A frustration that I totally understand. To paraphrase YouTuber Ian Danskin, diverse leftist communities or maybe not the best holding space for someone who's a bit of a Nazi but working on it? In the case of Megan Phelps Roper, I don't know if she has lingering bigoted sentiments, but what she does have is a kind of hypervigilant skepticism about anything she perceives as ideology. This is pretty common with people who used to be religious fundamentalists. They were so certain they were right, only to realize that everything they believed about the world is wrong. So they become distrustful of any strong moral convictions because it reminds them of their former fanaticism. Coming from Westboro, where I believed so strongly that I was doing the right thing, and then to leave and come to believe that it, it was so destructive and harmful, I had this, this moment in time, and it lasted for, for many months, where I was like, how can I ever trust my own mind again? This kind of skepticism is in some ways a good impulse, but valuing dispassionate intellectualism above all else can cause problems. Also, sound thinking is not dispassionate. It can be in a dispassionate mode in a specific circumstance, but that is motivated by a deep, passionate concern for what you're dealing with. Um, you, you use anesthetic for an operation because otherwise the, the operation would actually hurt. Not just as window dressing to feel cool about it, right? Um, and moreover, if you're totally dispassionate about something, the result is not that you tend to be more correct. The result is that those emotional things that would make you want to be careful and to be correct are gone. So... Like, for me, I'm listening to this story, and it's like, this isn't my experience, but I also came out of a fundamentalist background. Um, I shifted my perspective because I cared about things, and I pursued them, and they led me down a different path than I would have gone if I had just kind of passively went along with the stuff that I'd been raised with. Um, and a part of that is, I, incorrectly though I was in a lot of cases, I was raised by people who actually gave a shit even if they were wrong about things, and they inculcated that in me. And so that's how I worked my way out of this. Um, so, like, not, 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 tr if you don't trust how you think after escaping from it, um, maybe that signifies that the manner in which you escaped from it is a little bit suspect. Maybe you didn't escape from it because you actually saw reason. Maybe you escaped from it because of things that didn't directly interface with your reason. And that's kind of what I'm getting from this. Despite her, like, concern trolling about how, hey, look, I, I was taken out of the Westboro Baptist Church, the worst church on earth, because people were just polite to me and willing to hear, hear my story, my tale of woe. Um, I don't trust it. I don't trust that she would correctly gauge what the actual beats were in her own history, and I don't trust her now to be interested enough to tell the truth if it was disadvantageous to her image. Especially where topics of social justice are concerned. Because it can lead you to this kind of toxic centrism that asks, why are marginalized people so unwilling to have calm, 
philosophical debates about whether they should have rights. Are they afraid of dangerous ideas? Atheist philosopher Sam Harris, in his podcast about Megan's podcast, can we talk about how there are too many podcasts? I'm calling for a complete and total shutdown of podcasts until we can figure out what's going on. Sam Harris, in his podcast about Megan's podcast, complained that trans activism and activism in general is plagued by mental illness and hysteria. I frankly think there, there's a fair degree of- <sighs> I hate this guy so fucking much. I hate him. I hate him. It's like evil Ben Stiller. His, his voice is, guys, super chat me. I am experiencing physical pain for you. Mental instability and, and even frank mental illness in the activist community. I mean, in, in, in really in all activist communities, the level of He's so dumb. viciousness and hysteria is, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know what to compare it to. Diversity when man accuses trans women of being hysterical. Is it really hysteria to react with strong emotions when your basic inclusion in society is up for debate? Aren't there certain situations where strong emotions are warranted? It reminds me of this awful episode of Joe Rogan feat Ben Shapiro, where Lil Benny argues that gay marriage is immoral with his usual whining sophistry, and Joe gently raises objections for Ben to talk circles around. The human sex drive was made to procreate within a stable relationship in order to progenerate and have future generations of people. Misuse of that sex drive in any way, whether you're talking about from masturbation to homosexual activity, is therefore a diminishment of the use of that drive. That's the natural law case against, against homosexual activity. All of the top comments on this video are like this. Imagine talking about different beliefs while still having a productive conversation. Things progress when you don't demonize people. The discussion. Thank you for the five dollars in some new Anesthesia is when money. Indeed. ...here was excellent. Two guys with opposing opinions, speaking calmly and intellectually without cursing, shouting and making disparaging comments about each other. This is how it should be done. Kudos to both of them. Joe is a great interviewer. He can totally disagree with someone and still have a calm, collective conversation. This is how it should be. Just two people sharing ideas, learning different point of views from each other. This is why Joe is the number one podcast. Joe Rogan beautifully asks the tough questions, and Ben answers honestly. He is strong in his faith. I love this debate because it's two so contrasting views and they have a civil conversation. Great learning. And Thank you for uh, the fourteen ninety nine. dollars uh, the problem. More like spam Harris, exactly. Um, oh, there was a, there was a Ham Saris video. Hang on, let me see if I can't find one. We'll take a quick divergence. Very, very quick. You will, you will thank me for this. If anyone hasn't seen this, you don't understand what you're missing. Keep on sleeping with Sa with uh, Ham Saris with Paul Bloom. Here, let me. We won't listen to the whole thing. Just a little bit. Thank you, August. Appreciate it. Welcome to the Keep On Sleeping podcast. This is Ham Harris. Today I'm going to be speaking with Paul Bloom. He's a psychopath who was going through his life harming people. A serial killer who just hates people or gets sadistic pleasure out of their suffering. And he goes around, you know, torturing and murdering kids. You know, was beating people up in high school. And now he's just kind of graduated to more high-tech crime. He's <laughs> killing thousands of people. He's keeping sex slaves. He's a monster. If there's more evil to be found in the universe than that, I don't know where to look for it. You know, the, the, the prototypically evil person, I feel like I understand that. So I, I really have nothing negative to say about that. And without any more fine print, I now give you Paul Boom. Well, I now have Paul Boom on the line, notorious robot doctor. Hey, Paul, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. Notorious, huh? Yes. Notorious for um, attacking empathy. I, I want to just back up and introduce you to listeners who may not be totally familiar with your work. So Paul Bloom is against empathy, but for violence. Uh, that's right. That's right. So <laughs> that's right. It's not, it's not that we don't care for others enough. It's a problem is mm -hmm. we don't care for our own enough. Yeah, I, I find myself totally sympathetic with that attitude. 
So just just imagine if you know you had a a burning building, and our children were in there, and I could run in to save them. Say I'm I'm on site, and I I can run in and save whoever I can save. But because I know my child's in there, my priority is to get my child. And who could blame me for that, right? That's so right. I run in there and. I see your child, who I can quickly save, but I need to look for my child. So I just run past your child and go looking for mine. And at the you know the end of the day, I save no one, say, or yes. I only save mine. It really, really was a zero-sum contest between yours and mine. I really am in that burning building. Yeah, I am in that burning building, buying my son an Xbox while kids from Africa die in the corner. I, like a lot of parents, spend a lot of money on my kids, including toy, expensive toys and vacations and so on, while other children die. Uh, the last thing in the world we need is fairness. And, and a good society reduce everything to politics. I think one of the good things, this takes a different topic, one of the good things of a society like ours, if all the white Americans decide they want to reinstantiate the institution of slavery, they can. I think good diets work that way. Yeah. I think that that's right. I think that um, it would be fair enough to assume. Oh, apropos. Thank you, uh, Sister Rose, for the two euros. Sam Harris is why I took the Shahada. All right. Yeah, this is editing. This was done before uh, AI was a thing that you could make audio clips with. I'm like, yeah, it's easy for two straight men to have a dispassionate theoretical conversation about the ethics of homosexuality because it's not their lives and their relationships that are up for debate. These people don't understand the emotional burden placed on marginalized people who are asked to defend their rights. Like if you're straight, do you want to publicly debate whether your marriage is valid? Andrew Dworkin claimed that penetrative heterosexual intercourse is inherently an act of violence. I've noticed that most straight men don't want to have a calm, civil conversation about that. So imagine how they'd react if there was a powerful political movement to criminalize penetration or revoke their right to marry. Add in a lifetime of ostracism, family rejection, bullying, and discrimination, and maybe then you'll begin to understand the hysteria of a lot of queer people. It is my right to raise my child with the moral precept that I find to be beneficial for my child. Beto O'Rourke does not get to raise my child. And if he tries, I will meet him at the door with a gun. That is insane. Wow, Ben Shapiro threatening violence because he can't handle the debate. Ben looks younger than his child. Sounds like a classic case of hysteria to me. Why can't Ben Shapiro just have a polite conversation about Beto O'Rourke transing his children? I now have two choices. One is to leave the country utterly. Two is to pick up a gun. Those are the only choices that you have left me. Dave Rubin is a gay conservative whose career requires that he convince his right-wing audience that he's one of the good ones. This means that he's willing to sit across from his so-called friend, homophobe Ben Shapiro, and listen to Ben say he would never attend his anniversary party because it would be tantamount to endorsing sin. There's a difference between me just being friends with Dave and me actively participating in an event that I feel is religiously sinful. The two of them then congratulate themselves about how they can still be great friends. Why is it that we're able to do this and most people can't do this? Because That's what I'm curious. Because you aren't actually friends and there are no real stakes involved for either of you. We go home at night and we can have our own lives. And here's Dave having a civil conversation with conservative Glenn Beck. Thank you, Justin JBG, for the $5. Much appreciated compares homosexuality to alcoholism, and then congratulates himself on having the conversation. I am a deeply religious man, and my religion says man and a woman, uh, that is the basic building block of family. And that's what I believe, but I also am, I also, I also know God created you just like he created me, flaws and all. Uh, you know, um, I believe I have a gene, they've never found it, that makes me very susceptible to alcoholism because it runs in my family. So does Christ. This is the face of a broken man. This cost him his soul. There's nothing in there anymore because he can't stomach the pain. Craziness, but it runs in my family. Well, Dave smiles and nods. Probably. <laughs>
Is that a, is that a smile? I mean, maybe for him that's a oh, smile. Because it runs in my family. You know, if I was him, I'd probably smile in the same way. So does craziness, but it runs in my family. Well, Dave smiles and nods, probably because he's thinking about how much he enjoys the taste of boots. Usually, I just take out a picture of me and DeSantis, and then we're good, because they get it, they get it, that's my governor, yeah. I think a lot of straight people look at Dave Rubin, and they see, finally, a reasonable gay person who doesn't scream, beg it at everyone who disagrees and can actually have a civil conversation. But that's not what I see. I look at Dave Rubin and I see a sabineless, boot-licking doormat who won't even defend his own family from the most fundamental disrespect. I also can't help but notice that none of these sabineless these civil conversations seem to change anyone's mind. Persuasion is more complicated and less rational than people think. Megan often says that she was de-radicalized on Twitter, but if you read her book carefully, you'll notice that that's not exactly true. The major precipitating event for Megan's crisis of faith was her mother's mistreatment at the hands of an increasingly misogynistic church leadership that made Megan feel like she was the victim of the church for once. She says of the church discipline, for the first time in my life, the accused were people I lived with and knew most intimately, and I knew that the judgments leveled by the elders were wrong. I could no longer blindly trust the judgment of these men. So she finally experienced firsthand what it's like to be the victim of her family. She stopped voting for the Leopards Eating People's Faces party only when the Leopards ate her face. It also seems relevant to notice that the people who had calm, civil conversations with Megan on Twitter were generally not gay people, the people most affected by her family's violent rhetoric. They are mostly straight men, like director Kevin Smith, who started hashtag save Megan because, quote, she's hot. There's often an erotic component to persuasion, and that certainly seems to be the case with Megan, because one of the people who well, there it is. helped de-radicalize her is now her husband. And I feel like that's a relevant detail if we're- Because her husband looks like he's possessed by Satan. Oh my god, it's like a cross between, uh, cr cross between, um, oh shoot, what's his name? It's like a cross between Brendan Fraser and Homelander. If we're trying to understand the role of reason and emotion in de-radicalization experiences, I think this experience is usually more akin to religious conversion than it is to logical reasoning. There's also a world of difference between the mostly private conversations that actually lead people to reflect on their beliefs and the spectacle of public debate. Ben Shapiro is never going to become less homophobic because he live streamed a civil conversation with Dave Rubin. So who is this conversation even for? Well, obviously it's for the audience. I think these civil conversations basically function to reassure a homophobic audience that just because they disagree with the lifestyle doesn't mean that they hate gay people. Look at Ben Shapiro. He is friends with a gay. Public debate is one way that- Also, Ruben can never win. He must always just passively smile and nod. Yeah, I guess we can agree to disagree. I guess. And so long as he does that, he'll be accepted. But he can't win. He can't win an argument. If he wins an argument, he's out. Too dangerous that we define the limits of the Overton window, the range of beliefs that are socially acceptable to hold. So often people who want to promote bigotry will use debate as a foot in the door. It's a way of establishing that their prejudices are within the realm of reasonable and socially accepted opinion. Here's obsessive anti-trans bigot Graham Linehan in a fury that a drag queen is on Doctor Who without the British public having a proper debate about these issues. Now, why do we need to have a proper debate about whether drag queens should be allowed on television when drag performance has been a staple of British entertainment? No, no, no. Mistake. Uh, it being a staple of British entertainment is irrelevant. Um, the drag queen 
is a subject of the British crown. Um, and therefore, whatever they're called, they're allowed to be on television without the, uh, without, what's this, what's it, the Graham, was it? I keep forgetting his name. These, these people all look the same to me. Um, I'll look like Homer Simpson if he melted like a flan. Um, they're allowed on television. That's it. That's it. Your people who are British citizens are allowed on British television. That's that's how that works. Uh, you do not need to have a debate about whether black people can be on British television. You do not need to have a debate about whether women can be allowed on British television. This is stupid. It's stupid. It also like flies directly against the whole free speech argument that they're making. Because this is like basic... This isn't even... This is a condition of even having speech. They're actually able to be seen and heard. That's that's the point at which it's too much for him. About whether drag queens should be allowed on television, when drag performance has been a staple of British entertainment since at least the time of Shakespeare. Life is a joke, that's just begun. Fishy, 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 fish. As I am. Man, my state is desperate for my master's love, as I am woman. Now, alas, the day. Bigots like Graham want a perpetual no debate was. on their own terms, because this is how they dignify their pearl clutching. It's how they convince the public that their moral panic about drag queens on TV is actually a valid concern, rather than the tedious, small-minded whining about nothing that it really is. Having the debate on a bigot's terms is not a good way to win people over, unless you're really skilled in the art of humiliating people, which most of the time is what public debate is actually about. This is something that J.K. Rowling doesn't seem to understand. In The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, Joe Rowe takes a contradictory stance on deplatforming. She brings up right-wing provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos, saying that activists are making a strategic error and giving Milo power by protesting his events, making him look dangerous and sexy. But when trans people try to deplatform TERFs, Rowling characterizes this as silencing. So is deplatforming a strategic error that gives power to your opponent? Or is it a powerful tactic of silencing? I find Rowling's conviction that we ought to debate Milo Yiannopoulos really out of touch. Milo Yiannopoulos doesn't have reasons for the things he does. He has strategies for humiliating people. I've taken some time out of my busy schedule, being fabulous and doing my hair, to prepare a speech for you. Well, a few remarks, really. Feminism is cancer. Thank you very much. To again quote Ian Danskin, you can't really reason with someone who thinks that feminism is cancer. Because you don't reason with cancer, you eradicate it. Rowling objects to the slogan, no debate, in the strongest possible terms. And then we come to the famous two-word slogan, the stock phrase, no debate, no debate, no debate. We hear it all the time. That alarms me, really alarms me. I can't think of a purer instance of authoritarianism than no debate. It's kind of amazing to me that someone could think angry trans people on Twitter are the purest example of authoritarianism. I truly hope that one day I- Actually, by the way, some of the most sophisticated conservatives I've met, actually, I would say the most sophisticated conservatives I've met have been trans women. You wouldn't think it, um, <laughs> but dear God, there's weird stuff happening. I'm privileged enough to be capable of such a perspective. <laughs> Before I move on, I do want to clarify that I do think there are trans issues that are legitimately debatable by people who are not bigots. In my opinion, trans women and women's- Hey, here's something. Um, you don't know the outcome of debates. It seems that's, that's the whole point to them. You don't know the outcomes of them, right? Okay, so in a liberal society which is premised on the consent of the governed and on the absolute respect of the rights and dignity of citizens qua citizens, debating whether or not an entire category of citizens should even be allowed to be represented in public media, 
uh, or, or to even be uh, classified according to their own lights, probably should not be referred to a, a, a random chaotic process whose outcome cannot be predicted um, against their wishes. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And it becomes immediately obvious as soon as you turn the crosshairs onto another group and say, maybe the abolition of slavery was a bad idea. There are people who argue this. If that argument is allowed or able to become prevalent, then you may be in a situation in which a whole lot of your citizens are now completely depersoned and unable to engage in a debate because they have been successfully construed as not being worthy of the rights of the rightful partisans, parties to that debate. It's pretty basic. It's actually a basic tenet of liberalism, going back to John Locke and John Stuart Mill. Um, the ideal is that provided the ideas being spread are not deleterious to the health or stability of the, the community, um, then the magistrate should keep a hands-off approach and let people talk. When they become deleterious to the health of the community, or to large parts of the community, or to its stability, then the magistrate actually has to step in, because the conditions of freedom of speech is not a state of nature. You actually have to maintain society in order to accommodate this. That There's a reason why we don't talk about the, the, the vibrant... Uh, uh, diverse intellectual lives of pre-human primates. Um, it took thousands of years and a bunch of accidents to get to a point where we even value this. And there is no reason to think that once lost, you will ever necessarily get it again. That's fortunate if you do. Sports is one of those issues. But... It's a complicated issue. Like, first of all, which sport are we talking about? Are we talking about figure skating? Middle school field hockey? I see no reason why trans girls should be excluded from that. But if we're talking about professional weightlifting, well, then it seems plausible that trans women who have been through male puberty may still retain some kind of group advantage. But not all trans women have experienced male puberty. People are transitioning younger now, and that's another thing you have to consider. So I'm not against debating this issue, I just want people to approach it with nuance and good faith. And currently, a lot of the people who are vocally against trans women and women's sports sound like this. And we will keep men out of women's sports. Right? How ridiculous. That will take place on day one. And I don't want to debate those people. I want to serve them a banana cream pie. Chapter 6. Illiberal Methods One of J.K. Rowling's core complaints about the trans rights movement is she- Isn't their argument that it is deleterious? It sometimes is. More often than not, though, it's actually not about it being deleterious. That's sort of secondary. Um... That's why it falls to a decision. You can't refer everything to a process. Somebody has to decide. Somebody has to pick out which are the deleterious ideas and which ones aren't. It's the way it is. It sucks. But we like we like to think that we can just dev devise a process that just takes all the responsibility away from us, so that nobody. It's like the it's like the the mask over the head of the executioner. So that we don't have to say, hey, look, uh, it was it was this this person who did it. It was it's like, no, no, it was a fair, even process. And uh, if, however, whatever the outcome was, uh, as long as the process was followed, that's justice. Um, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Case in point, you have to be a person to be involved in the process to begin with. And most people didn't start off that way. She sees it as illiberal in its methods. So when I first became interested and then deeply troubled 
by what I saw as a cultural movement that was illiberal in its methods. So what are these illiberal methods? If you are saying this person is cancelled, that is the language of a dictator. It's true. Cancel culture is exactly how the Third Reich started. First, they cancelled the socialists, and I did not speak out because the hashtag was trending. But maybe we should see what an actual dictator thinks. But they're making the argument, should people never make an argument, then I'm not a fan of this line of logic. We're talking about arguments about the validity of an entire class of citizens. Uh, in, in a public setting, by celebrities who are spreading essentially propaganda, regardless of your position on it, it's easily identifiable as propaganda, um, that targets a class of the citizenry. Um, no, that that probably that probably shouldn't um, shouldn't be given like free reign to just poof, everywhere. There are consequences to that. Um, there are consequences to freedom. Uh, like th that that is deleterious to the conditions of freedom. This isn't a conjecture about the effects on other members of, of society in terms of, oh, well, what happens if trans women get to use women's washrooms? What happens if trans women are in sports? What happens if we abandon, uh, what happens if we start to treat genders if it's not true? Like, these are conjectures about things that are not specifically germane to a question about constitutional rights. But debates about whether or not one of these people can even appear on a screen, for example, that is, that's different. That's, that's uh, putting under existential um, jeopardy um, the ability of an entire population to even be heard. So that's, that's where I would draw the line. John Rowling, after. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a state who's doing that, right? It, I, I, I agree with you. This is one of the big dilemmas, is that, like, under present conditions, the censor is always going to be someone we don't trust. So. This is a least of two evils kind of thing. You know, I can't help but wonder what counts as acceptable activist methods to an author for whom Hermione protesting slavery was taking things too far. I am fighting what I see as a powerful, insidious, misogynistic movement. I do not see this particular movement as either benign or powerless. Rowling seems to think that the trans rights movement is dangerous and authoritarian in some unprecedented way that makes it different from all past liberation movements. But how? What are these illiberal... You're a little bit late, Brooks. Um, Graham Lineham, whatever you call him, the tweet that was shown was him uh, complaining about a uh, drag queen being on television. That's, that's, what the, that's what he was complaining about methods that distinguish trans rights activism from similar past movements. Canceling? Anita Bryant was way more canceled than J.K. Rowling ever will be. Boycotts? Boycotts have been a staple of every progressive movement in modern history. Disrupting feminist meetings? Disrupting feminist meetings is a feminist tradition. Haven't you heard of the Lavender Menace? In 1969, Betty Friedan, author of The Feminine Mystique, and founder of the National Organization for Women and Second Wave Feminism in... Okay, well, uh, not Brooks. Like, they just require them to be in their gender normative clothing. Do you, do you think he would change his tune if it was a transgender woman or man who was wearing gender neutral clothing, but was still identified as transgender? I don't think so. I think that's unlikely general coined the phrase lavender menace just see if um oh fuck what's his name who's that uh i keep i keep forgetting his name he's unfortunately famous for juno what's what's his name again that trans man you know who i'm talking about there's a 30 second delay so one of you will tell me any second now Elliot Page, thank you. If uh, if Graham has uh, any issue with Elliot Page, then we we put the light of that. It's not about clothing, because Elliot Page is is Elliot Page. 
wears clothing that I've I've seen women wear. Like it's 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 typically boyish, like it's masculine clothing, but there's no rule about the kind of clothing that he wears that would indicate that this is only a, a man's wear, right? So I don't know. To describe the threat she believed that lesbians posed to the women's movement. Friedan was worried that being associated with lesbians would make it easy to dismiss the movement as a bunch of mannish man-haters. This understandably pissed off a bunch of lesbians who attended the second Congress to Unite Women in 1970. Graham's wife took his uh, brain cells in the divorce settlement to stage what used to be known as a ZAP, a disruptive public protest designed to draw attention to gay rights issues. Think glitter bombing. Think pies. Half aggression, mm, half whimsy. Like that pie. time the lesbian Avengers zapped Rowling's friend Baroness Nicholson's house, demanding that she resign. This podcast has pushed me over the edge. Centrism has gone too far, and I am now pro-cancel culture. Oh, so just God, as the finally. meeting was beginning, a group of 17 lesbians wearing Lavender Menace t-shirts switched off the lights, pulled the plug on the mic, and charged down the aisles, laughing and screaming. Their leader, Rita Mae Brown, took the mic and yelled, This conference won't proceed until we talk about lesbians in the women's movement. One of the now organizers yelled back, I object to your coming in and taking over this meeting. You're acting like men. Betty Friedan would later speculate that the lesbians were a CIA psyop designed to make the women's movement look bad. So the Lavender Menace disrupted the feminist meeting using illiberal tactics, not because they were against feminism, Feminism, but because they I'm wanted a lesbian exclusionary feminists to include them. It's the same thing that's happening today when trans people disrupt feminist meetings, as J.K. Rowling puts it, interestingly neglecting to mention which oh feminist God. meetings these are. I was starting to see activists behaving in a very aggressive way outside feminist meetings. There was a feminist meeting in which they were uh, banging and kicking on windows, very threatening. There's a historical obliviousness to Rowling's idea that trans activists are somehow more aggressive than similar past movements. Like she retweeted a transphobic gay man called Dennis Noel Kavanaugh, who says, All those gay rights and AIDS protests, I don't remember a single one where we intimidated or silenced a woman. Not a single one. Not a single one. Not a single one. Not a single one. Single one. <laughs> Dennis has also tweeted that he preferred AIDS to the trans movement. And also, uh, quote, I will fucking nail you to a wall what you have done to these innocent children. Your mutilation of these little human because they were gay will be nothing compared to what I will. <laughs> To, to what I will do to you legally. You think you are ghouls. Wait till <laughs> I deal with you, bastard, and I mean to. Dennis, it's time to log off, Gorge. I do wonder, does Dennis threatening to nail people to a wall count as illiberal methods? I guess JK Rowling doesn't think so because she's never condemned it. In fact, when Dennis's Twitter suspension ended, she was right there to welcome him back and she continues to retweet him. I've always been happy to acknowledge that angry trans people on Twitter sometimes take things too far. Things like death threats or misogynistic insults, I don't support that and oh, I've here it comes. in the past. Like when the leftist streamer Vosh, drama alert, who is not trans, tweeted at JK Rowling, women be quieter and start apologizing challenge. I called him out tweeting, doing edgy ironic misogyny while defending trans people magnifies the grain of truth in what turfs say about there being misogyny in trans activism. I tweeted that because I recognize that if people who are claiming to speak for you are doing so in a misogynistic way, and if you let that slide, you're going to wake up one day to find that you're in a misogynistic movement. Of course, Vosh took the- All right, so here's, here's my take on this. <clears throat> And it's been a hot minute, so I'm going to be recollecting this a little bit badly. Um, Natalie is sanitizing her end of this a little bit, but that doesn't matter. Um, let's leave all the cat black stuff out. Let's just not touch on that at all, okay? Vosh handled this really stupidly. The joke was off color. The joke was unwise politically. The joke was disrespectful and wrong. That being said, this statement here, 
there being misogyny in trans activism. I tweeted that because I recognize that if people who are claiming to speak for you are doing so in a misogynistic way, and if you let that slide, you're going to wake up one day to find that you're in a misogynistic movement. That is a sociological claim standing in dire need of substantiation, and putting that on Vosh's head makes no sense unless you're actually willing or able to substantiate that. I don't know that that's true. I don't know that Vosh making a, a, a off-color misogynistic remark, we can call it that, um, will cause the movement, whatever she's referring to as if, as if Vosh is a movement leader or representative of, of any particular movement at, at all, um, will become, that doesn't follow. In fact, it kind of seems like, it kind of seems like the opposite has actually taken place. Um, as a, how do we put this? As a consequence of too much infighting on things that are more aesthetic than dangerous, which I think that counts, certainly in isolation. Um, as a consequence of that, a whole bunch of people um, have decided that uh, actually more overt statements like this, they're kind of fine. And actually, if we don't you know, just put up with them and let them kind of roll around or whatever, then we're actually just killing all conversation. And so as a consequence, not directly of this, but of like that general attitude, um, where in the middle of a skirmish with a very large, very large, very efficacious rhetorically um, opponent of, of a subcategory of your movement, if we will, um, that is being existentially targeted, uh, if you run interference padding out the criticisms of that person, the only thing that happens is you neuter that entire, that entire sphere and cause it all to pile in on each other from the vantage point of the outside. So what I observed happen was uh, a very large leftist figure got piled in on by another very large leftist figure, um, both of whom were in the right in terms of their opposition to Rowling, one of whom engaged in something very uncouth and disrespectful with respect to Rowling, the other one, to a certain extent, with respect to Vosh, once again, the cat black stuff, the details elude me, um, and as, as a consequence, that whole sector now is essentially like nullified. There's 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 no more there's no more capacity, um, really for for any kind of uh, organized focus from that whole sector. It's basically died. Um, the whole like Vosh sphere in this this particular area is 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 dead, and uh, that's attributable to Vosh ultimately because he decided to be dumb and proud and defend his ego over the 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 causes that that he's about and to his credit once again like despite this he didn't turn on that community um as as certain other individuals have recently um but nonetheless uh nobody was actually thinking about what any of this actually meant Nobody was thinking about what the impacts of what they were doing or saying on, on both ends would actually mean. Um, and as a result, nobody actually took Rowling to task. Uh, it was all so situated that she could just basically ignore everyone. The chickens are revolting. Here, let's see who's ranting in chat. I had that screen off for a sec. Let's see here. As far as jokes go, it's pretty tame. That's the thing, too. Like, I'm sorry. That one's tame. He, it, it, was, it was really tame. 
<laughs> I, I don't know what planet people are on. But, like, if that's the line, good luck. Good luck. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. There's not enough people. Okay? There, there are enough people to take out Vosh. There are not enough people. Because here's what you need to understand. When we say, like, the sphere of, like, online politics is, is a narrow margin of humanity as a whole. It's narrow. It can feel like a lot of people. Because sometimes some large creator or whatever piles in on somebody small. And it's like hundreds of people. Thousands of people are suddenly uh, tweeting at them and saying mean things. And maybe making a video commentary about them. And it's, it's, really, it's really stressful. Um, the amount of people... The amount of people who know about Rowling, who who Rowling has a voice to, is orders of magnitude bigger than well, maybe not orders of magnitude, but it's 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 many times bigger than Vosh's and Destiny's and everyone else's audience in this space combined. Maybe it changes a little bit when you get to like million sub tier, but it's 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 a lot. Um, they will never hear of most of this. They don't, they don't know of the existence of most of these people. Thank you, Rix, I appreciate it. Didn't Vosh also concede that the joke was sexist? Of course he did, the joke was sexist and he shouldn't have made it. However, once made, like... <laughs> When, when people in your movement who are on side and powerful, and this is important because people on your movement who are powerful are not common. You don't have an endless supply of them. When people like that slip up, there's, there's two things you need to take into account here. First, even if they suck personally, that's a tool in your kit, which doesn't mean just let them get away with anything, but dispose of them carefully um the second thing is since i was under the impression as i think many people were that these two were friends before that 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 these two had some kind of rapport talk it out like i i don't and if if, if it's intractable then say it's intractable and then say look i tried talking to vosh privately i tried um i tried making him see reason didn't work so i have to say uh, not in the direct line of sight of J.K. Rowling as a big published thing, so that that now operates as a shield for her. Um, I now have to say, like, guys, look, we can't really rely on this person anymore. Um, his ego's too much in it. He uh, puts his uh, the the gusto uh, that he gets from from saying these edgy things online over the su success of the movement. Uh, I'm not going to be a, that. That'd be a different thing, but. What it ended up being was a big dumpster fire on on both sides, not for Rowling. Rowling was sitting pretty on both sides. Uh, and the total dismantling of what had been actually up until fairly recently, um, a possibly quite potent coalition of creators and media figures. And uh, now it's just not. Um, ContraPoints basically disappeared. Um, from public life for forever until like her occasional yearly video release and Vosh went into his fortress arc which was the most strategically idiotic thing anyone can do you're a media figure you live or breathe based upon your ability to reach out to new audiences and to interact with other creators now Vosh is already wealthy it doesn't matter to him but a direct consequence of this is that an entire pull around which a whole bunch of other creators relied in order to grow and to network and to have some kind of like stability that created like a biome for lefty creators that's now gone it's still basically gone and there's there's very little collaboration anymore destiny side of things tons that's why people are migrating there because there's money to be made and there's the potential for growth there's not here anymore and that's a serious problem because now it has been made the case that at least in this small sphere and this can be replicated elsewhere and has been at least in this small sphere, there is now a material impetus to not be part of the movement, which means that now you have to rely on every single person being completely sincere 
and on board with it at all times in order to support it against material pressure, which is a problem because that is a minority of a minority of a minority. Like, you're just outnumbered a million to one then. You lose. We lose when we do this. And by we, I don't mean ContraPoints. I don't mean Vosh. Everybody else does. That was two stupid people who were just too privileged to actually give a shit about the long-term consequences of what they actually did. And the actual effects are contained and minuscule in the grand scheme of things, but it still mattered. And that's the kind of thing that we actually really need to not let slide, because that will make your movement potentially misogynistic. Why? Because there is now a material impetus to basically politically show thigh by being edgy to appeal to people in communities that still actually have some kind of economic viability. It's, it's, it was just stupid. And by the way, like, she is right. She is correct. He shouldn't have said that because we also don't know. It, it could set a bad precedent. That could become normalized. But the response to that was also dumb. And then the response to the response to that was dumb. Everybody's dumb. I hate this place. Of course, Vosh took the criticism really well, explaining that... Thank you, August Gardner, for the 499 Transliberation Movement with Misogynistic Characteristics. Dear God. That actually, Ugh, I just didn't understand you're very funny. the complex tactical arguments for the moral necessity of being misogynistic to J.K. Rowling. And then he accused me of cancel culturing him, while at the same time literally telling his followers to publicly shame me. The more of you are in the replies being like, that's not what's happening right here. Like, this is necessary, okay? Publicly shame her into... Oh, you fucking idiot. Why would you ever say that live? You'd never say that at all, but why would you ever say... He's such a bonehead. He, look... <laughs> my, my engagement with Vosh started with criticizing him, okay? He's, he's a dumbass. Um, he's not stupid, but he's a dumbass. This whole thing was dumb. This was so dumb. This was so dumb. And I know why he did it. Because we've all done this at some point. You get told by a hundred people, Hey, that what are you doing? That's really stupid. What are you going to do? You're going to say, Yeah, I guess I'm stupid. You're going to, like, that's going to be you. No, no, you're going to fight to the death. Because maybe you can win. Maybe you can save it. It's like, no, Vosh. No, you can't. And this is what kills me, too. Because you know what would have actually gone... Both sides of this were stupid. Really stupid. Had Vosh just conceded, he would have disarmed the critique. And then afterwards, we could then have a debate about whether or not allowing edgy humor like that actually poses some kind of long-term threat. You can do that. Just the, just impatient, panicked, dumb, no, no long-term thinking. It's just, ugh. I think he's learned from this, but dear God, that was a mistake. Mistakes were made that year. That was a bad year. Thank you, Brooks, for the for the 50 gifted memberships. Very much appreciated, and thank you for the $2 for admitting we're all stupid. Is that a controversial statement these days? Changing your mind on that. Then bringing up my past struggle with addiction. Move you off this site and into... I don't want to bring up the substance abuse. So that pretty much... Then don't bring it up! Why did you bring it up? What? I forgot about that. Why did you say that? That was so dumb. Here's, here's what you had to do, Vosh, okay? If you weren't going to concede... Vosh, Ian, I'm looking at you. If you weren't going to concede, the right thing to say was nothing. Just, just carry on. Ugh! Thank you, Insomnoir, for the $5. I remember the Vush conversation. I was there live for it. I'm here now and not watching Vosh anymore for what it's worth. Look, I, I don't... I don't... I, I have I, I have some consideration for Vosh, once again. Because despite all of this... Um, he didn't... And this is a big deal. Because there's money to be made if he did. He did not go... Uh, he did not go, actually, uh, you know, I saw the light, and now I'm just kind of an edgy centrist, you know, spends my time berating other lefties. 
Maybe he does that a little bit sometimes, but he didn't he didn't like just abandon his trans viewership, which maybe maybe big in terms of trans viewerships are concerned, but it's not the majority of his audience. Um, he didn't do that for easy cash, and that merits consideration. Once again, if you have people who are who are still on side like that. You can't actually afford to throw everybody away for not being perfect. We literally can't. We run out of people really fast. Like, let's take a tally. Like, just in this space. and Like, this is the space that that I am able to interact with, right? This is the space that I can interfere with. So when I think about who do we actually have uh, compared to who we're up against, the scales look like this. And that doesn't mean we're dependent on Vosh. That doesn't mean, like, we need to give Vosh, like, uh, a, a free pass if he, if he fucks up. But it just means we need to be smart about it and not do it in such a way as, as we hand the people who actually want to destroy those communities that we're advocating for a free win on a silver platter. Like, there's... Ugh. Which confirms to me that Vosh doesn't actually care about advocating for trans people and just uses trans rights as a pretext to act like a fucking dinkus. I won't tell you to publicly. Sh Hang on, say it again. That's that's too much. Explaining that actually, I just didn't understand the complex tech. With respect, the arguments given in your videos support my position here, and with all the associated context, this really isn't the best place to speak on it with nuance. I'm extremely confident you'd agree with me if you were fully caught up. It just strikes me as off that you're extremely confident you definitely know better than a trans woman who's been doing this activism for over a decade, and it kind of compounds my discomfort with the woman be quiet or tweet. That is a silly argument. I I'm, I'm sorry, like, like her being trans does not mean she has deep sociological insight into the effects of, of specific kinds of tweets. That's a... These are very specific claims that were being made. Um, like, like she is she is fielding her identity quite explicitly here as a counter argument. That's that's foolish. Practical arguments for the moral necessity of being misogynistic to J.K. Rowling, and then he accused me of cancel culturing him while at the same time literally telling his followers to publicly shame me. The more viewer in the replies being like, "Sorry, I know I rebound too much. We're almost there." That's not what's happening right here. Like, this is necessary, okay? Publicly shame her into... She's glossing over a lot of this, too. Wasn't she... Because this cat black person, I can't remember the details, but wasn't she, like, like, shaming Vosh with, like, personal messages and things like that? Like, it got, it got a bit messier than this is being portrayed. This wasn't just, like, she told Vosh, hey, cool it with the... Cool it with the anti-Semitism, bro, and then he flipped out. This was, uh... She, there, there was, it was more complicated than that. I remember that. Changing her mind on that. Then bringing up my past struggle with it. A lot of Vosh's awkwardness isn't uncoupled from his autism. Autism is not a defense for, for this, unfortunately. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, when you're a public figure, uh, you can't just go back on, especially like when this is, if this is like a known thing, right? If he knows already, if he has, if there's... Something about how he perceives social interactions that makes him put his foot in his mouth with a certain degree of regularity, then it actually becomes his responsibility at that point to prepare in advance to not do so. This is the drunk driver blaming the liquor. Um, that being said, this is beyond the pale. Addiction. Move you off this site and into... Not this one. I don't want to bring up the substance abuse. So that yeah, you mentioned the substance abuse. You mentioned you didn't not mention it. You just mentioned a different medium than what you were typing up. Pretty much confirms to me that Vosh doesn't actually care about advocating for trans people and just uses trans rights as a pretext to act like a fucking dingus. That's too far. I'm sorry. Um, no, Vosh does not just use trans rights to act like a fucking dingus. He actually does advocate for trans people. In the course of doing so, he also acts like a fucking dingus because he's a bonehead. Um... I, it's it's 2023 now. When did this take place? When was this? Like, I'm sorry. What is the point? Here's a possibility. Um, I was talking uh, about this last night with somebody. Here, here's the hypothesis. Okay, 
So ContraPoints is in a strange spot. Um, and I'm not casting aspersions. I'm, I'm, I'm speculating. This is entirely speculation, but it, it is what I'm speculating. So bear with me. Um, ContraPoints is in a difficult spot. She has been heavily criticized by people on the left for podcasts that she's been on that were perceived as irresponsible. Maybe they were. I tend to actually be more generous to her on, on that front. I think she was actually misled. I don't think it's her fault. Um, I believe she's had like transmedicalist takes in the past, something like that. Am I correct? She's been, she's not been like on board with the whole neo pronouns thing. It's been a, that's been a sticking point for her. Stuff like that. Um, she clearly does not have the, uh, stamina or the inclination to be in the public spotlight as a contentious figure for any significant length of time, which is why we get a grand total of like two hours of content from her in 12 months. So was there more? I can't remember. Let's, let's, let's pretend that she made three of these six hours of content in a year. Okay. Um, If I was in her position and I wanted an easier ride while not compromising on the stuff that I care about, my goal as somebody at a certain scale, greater than all these other creators, would be to make myself appealing as a conversation partner to actual celebrities and people in actual quote unquote media. And one of the ways I might do this, while simultaneously drumming up a lot of extra attention, what would otherwise be a fairly dull and rather late video, um, would be to offer up a, 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 a enemy or a frenemy who is, whose use has run its course as a sacrifice. Not necessarily a stupid or a bad move, but that's kind of what this looks like to me, because I can't conceive of any other reason... For her bringing this in. Because this is stale. This is very stale. It is so stale that we don't even care anymore. Among other things, it is stale because everybody else is a million times worse. And they're raking it in while doing so. So who's this appealing to? It's not appealing to lefties online. It's definitely not appealing to Vosh. It's definitely not appealing to, uh, to, to like the whole like Destiny sphere. It's not appealing to the red pill crowd. It's not appealing to transphobes. It's not appealing to homophobes. It's not appealing to Prager U watchers. It's not appealing to Fox News watchers. It's not appealing to anybody except uh, people who want to see more conversations between someone like ContraPoints, who is the responsible and the reasonable and the long-term thinking uh, lefty trans advocate uh, with more respectable people, quote-unquote, like J.K. Rowling, Megan, etc. And the fact that she appeared on that podcast um, while producing next to zero content suggests that that actually is something that she values. And I don't think that's categorically a bad thing if it doesn't look like that's what she's doing. But she's, she's not present enough. I think her last, was her last video the Envy one, or was that one before that? One of her last videos um, that she got a lot of flack for, justifiably so, was the Envy one, in which she was basically casting lefties as all being just motivated by jealousy towards the rich. Um, like, it's, it's, not, it's not a great look. Um, and in terms of, like, popularity among lefties in this space, like, there's, uh, there's, yeah, she literally shit on Dave Rubin for this. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, that's, that's what I suspect with 50% confidence is, is going on. Something along those lines. Um, I think she's trying to characterize herself as the reasonable one. As the one you should talk to if you're a big, big podcast or media figure. Um, and uh, 
you know, maybe maybe in a certain key she is. Certainly not in all keys, because once again, um, somebody wants to correct me on this. She's uh, extremely um, she's extremely callous to groups that she doesn't care about, um, neo pronoun people and and so forth, poor people and so forth, um, and. There's just, there's just a lack of skin in the game. When was her last video? Let's actually take a look at that. Hang on. Let me see. Let's see here. What, what, what are we... What are we, what are we spending our, our, our... What is this seasoned activist doing with her time? Ten months. Ten months since her last video. The Hunger. An hour long. An hour of content in ten months. Let's go back to a year ago. The Envy one. Oh, and the JK Rowling one is two years old now. So the Envy one, when was that published? August 2021. So it's it's like... Like, what is this? You you can't pull rank when your grand contribution is you show up maybe once every half a year or so. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like... The Hunger was a recap of her addiction battle that wasn't even an essay video. Let's pretend it was an essay, okay? Let's just I I'd rather I'd rather be charitable and still write. Um Like once again, like all all of these moves are being made by someone who clearly doesn't have like the long term interests of any movement or population actually in mind. It makes her feel really good. She is on the right side in this. But who is she ultimately? What is she actually doing? Not what is she saying, what is she doing? And you can do things by saying certain things. Wash has literally been one of the first people to say the Republicans were genocidal. That's true. I won't tell you to publicly shame him though, because unlike Vosh Maybe maybe like one of the uh, one of the first notables, uh, certainly in, in from what I've seen. I would never sink to that. The point I'm trying to make is I have no qualms about calling out people on my side whenever they go too far or cross a line or do stupid tweets and then mansplain to me about how I don't understand tactical misogyny. Idiot. But the same cannot be said of JK Rowling. I have never once seen her call out any of the bigotry and abusiveness that is absolutely rampant in the gender critical movement. Here's the, here's the problem, Contra. Uh, you didn't call out Vosh. You called out Vosh and diverted an attack on J.K. Rowling. Which means that what you actually did was not hold your movement to account. What you actually did was blunt one prong of attack against somebody who is making an existential attack against trans people and continues to do so, uh, you then caused a whole bunch of infighting in that sphere, nullifying any effect that any of those people could have because now they're all fighting each other, and then you disappeared. And did what? What, what were you... Is, Relatively high production values for this video. Philosophy tube turns out more and she has better. What are you doing? Some, not all this stuff Contra takes issue with is classic neurodivergent stuff. For example, him saying, I don't want to bring up her addiction. I, I don't know if that is. <sighs> You can't just, 
you can't just refer to every single thing that might be an underhanded play and might not be as, as just, oh, he must be being autistic then. Like, he, he can bear responsibility for that. Um, he's a public figure in any case. Being autistic doesn't mean you have no social responsibility, unfortunately. There's a great video called J.K. Rowling's New Friends by YouTuber Sean that exposes the dishonesty of framing this conflict as meek, concerned feminists versus the abusive trans mob. A framing that the witch trials of J.K. Rowling accepts uncritically, citing numerous examples of death threats and abusiveness from trans advocates. Things like, kill TERFs 2014. How about slowly and horrendously murder TERFs in saw-like torture machines and contraptions? Now, I don't think anyone should joke about putting people in saw traps, but also, how serious is this threat that was posted to Tumblr in 2014? Let's use our critical thinking skills here. Do you think that Jigsaw, the villain from the Saw movies, has a Tumblr account and is threatening TERFs? Or do you think this was posted by a 14 year old? The podcast cites zero examples of death threats and abusiveness from anti-trans bigots. And it's not exactly like you have to dig deep to find any. I can fill the screen up with examples just from people who JK Rowling has explicitly supported or interacted with. I will drive you out into the desert and bury you nine feet down, one tweet says from a fan of JK Rowling. First, I'll set you on fire and piss on your half alive corpse. Fuck trans activism. Fuck gender ideology and fuck you. Another threat from the same user is so graphically violent and sexual, I don't know if I can even read it aloud without violating the YouTube terms of service. But threats like this from the gender critical side are simply not mentioned in the witch trials of JK Rowling. Both Rowling and Megan seem happy to cherry pick threatening tweets and sound bites of shouting protesters. Fuck you, you ugly piece of shit. You look like the guy with teeth knocked out, you fucking fascist. As evidence that the trans movement is dangerous and insidious to the core. But this exact technique has been used against literally every liberation movement in world history. For example, Let's consider Reclaim the Night, the protest movement against sexual violence in Britain, which first got JK Rowling interested in feminism in the 1970s. Here's how The Guardian, Britain's spineless centrist paper of note, covered a Reclaim the Night protest in 1979. Chanting slogans against rape seems reasonable to promote awareness, but what about the hissing and swearing at any innocent male and cries of castrate men? We were all sympathetic to the principles of the women's liberation movement, but we left the crowd of shouting, torch-bearing women when it became clear that my friend's brother was running the risk of personal mutilation if he remained with us. The protesters were allegedly singing, Here I stand, my knife in hand, free castration on demand. So this is how the British press covered the women's movement. Angry, torch-bearing women screaming, castrate men. Now, is that a fair representation of the women's movement? Should we judge every movement by its most militant extremists? Is it fair, say, to pretend that Valerie Solanas, who shot Andy Warhol, who advocated for male extermination in her Society for Cutting Up Men manifesto, is representative of feminism as a whole? Many anti-feminists over the years have done exactly that. But it's not fair, is it? So why does JK Rowling think it's fair to judge the trans movement by the worst things trans people have ever tweeted? I want her to choke on my fat trans dick. And I made excuses for you then. In the fourth episode of The Witch Trials of JK Rowling, Megan interviews New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg, who has written sympathetically about transphobic feminism. There's a moment in this interview where Michelle kind of stumbles into an honest observation that I find fascinating. Right, I mean, I think you'll often hear people say, you know, I'm not gonna debate my basic humanity. And, and part of the difficulty is that there are indeed certain issues which we have sort of decided somewhat collectively with some sort of consensus are beyond the realm of, of debate. And I think that part of what is so difficult about this issue is that there are certain people who think that this kind of consensus can be imposed maybe as opposed to evolve organically. And so they're sort of desperately trying to shore it up in the hopes, I think, that if they can, they will enjoy the same sort of assumed protection as other groups whose rights we've decided are not up for 
a public conversation. I think the problem is that we don't actually have a consensus. So Michelle correctly observes that the reason trans people are often reluctant to debate our rights is that we want the same assumed protections as other groups whose rights liberals have decided are not up for debate. But then, Michelle suggests that trans people have to debate our rights because there isn't a mainstream consensus that we deserve rights. I am really curious to know how Michelle Goldberg thinks that past liberation movements have succeeded. Like, does she think that women's suffrage just evolved organically? Did suffragettes just have calm, civil conversations about- Also, the reason you have rights is specifically so that there isn't a consensus defending your access to things, say you nonetheless can maintain access to those things by force of the state. That's what those rights mean. But whether women are intellectually capable of voting until all the misogynists were rationally persuaded? No, they stood up and demanded their right to vote, sometimes violently, especially in the UK. Like, people forget this, maybe because they were called suffragettes, which is kind of a cutesy name, but the suffragettes they murdered people. There were suffragette terrorists. They broke windows, they bombed churches, they set fire to a theater. In 1909, a suffragette attacked Winston Churchill with a horse whip. Queen shit, honestly. The English suffragette Mary Lee threw a fucking hatchet at the prime minister's head. And my point is not to advocate terrorism or to excuse the terrorism of past movements. I think these kinds of tactics have tended to turn people against the movement. I don't think it's effective, but let's not pretend that past movements have never made demands before everyone was ready. I know she knows that I was adding, I wasn't uh, correcting her. Because there never has been, and there never will be a time when everyone is ready. I mean, Mary Wollstonecraft published The Vindication of the Rights of Women in 1792, and misogyny, in case you hadn't noticed, remains rampant. So there never has been a consensus about women's rights, and there probably never will be. In fact, marginalized groups wouldn't need rights if there was a consensus that we deserve rights. Exactly, there you the go. The whole reason yeah, to said. have rights is to protect you from the kind of people who think you shouldn't have them. I there mean, it's go. a nice thought See? that we can just politely persuade everyone to give us rights, but the reality is, that's not how this works, and it never has been. This is a really solid essay so far. The last few minutes was stupid. It was really dumb. And it looked petty. And I don't believe it was sincere. <sighs> Just sucks. I hate it when people do this. Like, how do these debate me centrists think go. that slavery ended in the United States? Well, between 1861 and 1865, there was a little event called the American Civil Debate. See what I'm holding in my hand? This is a high caliber idea that I picked off the polite discussion field of Manassas. Do you people think that American schools were integrated because all the white people in the South were persuaded that segregation is bad? No dum-dums. Eisenhower had to send in the hundred and... Oh yeah. On the subject of uh, Twitter dogpiling, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, Contra in her infinite wisdom came out of the woodwork to go after a philosophy tube for saying that, essentially, uh, gender dysphoria as a category should not be treated as the as, as a thing with such a high degree of testable reality, because it is largely an ideological construction. It has to be, because it encompasses a whole different bunch of, of you know, feelings and psychological things and dynamics and whatnot and associations that we do not have a masterful clinical handle on, um, uh, against people who are espousing a transmedicalist point of view, essentially. And that was, that was the great enemy. That's the person who, who Contra came out against, ultimately. She had a video against J.K. Rowling. The nice, nice, careful, planned thing that will result in nobody going out of their way to harass Rowling. Um, puts the weight of her Twitter account against another another trans person on Twitter, which is just like just dumb, just dumb. This is my this is why I don't like contrapoints, and I want to. I want to like contrapoints. I've got no reason to not want to like her. Um, she's disingenuous, and she's a bit of a coward. And the reason why I say she's a bit of a coward is because. 
It has now become a constant feature of her online presence that she will do things and say things, get flack for it, and bury the history of it. Endlessly. From the petty to the serious. Um, and she she just does not hold herself accountable for anything. And since she became rich, she's also become extremely classist towards other leftists. And it's just like, come on. Just come on. I like ContraPoints more than Philosophy too, but I think the production values get too sleek. Abigail and Contra agree. I know they agree on transmedicalism. I, I wasn't saying they don't. Philosophy Tube actually did make a good point. She was horrendously misunderstood, and given the nature of her audience, she probably stated it unwisely. Um, I haven't seen Poppy and Xena's video on it that, that calls her an idiot for it. I don't see it. Um, I'll have to watch it one of these days and see what they actually said. But it's just like... Like, once again, just the total lack of long-term thinking, of actually thinking in terms of what's good for the other people in the movement, so to speak. I have to say so to speak, because we aren't talking about, like, discrete organizations or anything. We're, we're talking about a bunch of random anonymous social media users who happen to pile in when certain figures speak. I thought Poppy and Xena had good points. I'm not surprised they have good points. They're usually pretty solid. Um, just judging from what I've seen, I, I didn't I didn't see the basis for what I understood their critique to be. Um, which was largely in favor of the clinical value of gender dysphoria as as a diagnostic, I think. But I'll I'll have to I'll have to watch what they said. I don't want to speak to it without having seen it. It's been a busy, busy few weeks. What was that anti contra screed for then? What do you mean what was the anti contra screed for then? No, the point is that this person tries to pull rank. Like, she's, she's the one who knows how to do trans activism. And then she just vanishes. She gets rich off a couple of video essays, disappears, is, is basically not, not seen or heard from, except on Twitter occasionally. Um, and then her, her biggest clash to date was against Philosophy Tube, against another trans person for, for having a... And not, not like, not like a, a, a carefully managed disagreement between peers... But just a Twitter spat. It's stupid. Like, there are actual real stakes to this stuff. What she is doing is exactly what she's criticizing here. Throwing the outcome of, like, like political discussions that have real consequences for real people, maybe permanent ones, uh, to, to, the, to chance. D you don't do that. That's foolish. I saw Philosophy Tube's explanation of fascism. That shit was absolutely embarrassing. I made a video responding to that, which I now have to actually redo because this is before she came out. So that's great, I just realized. Brilliant. First airborne to enforce that shit at gunpoint. And my point is not to equate LGBT rights movements with black civil rights. I am aware that being a white queer person is not in any way equivalent to living in the aftermath of slavery. I'm just saying that there's this tendency to sanitize history and to imagine that progress was smooth and bloodless, that consensus evolved organically when it just didn't. And then people get the impression that current movements are somehow more militant than successful past movements when they just aren't. I am fighting what I see as a powerful, insidious, misogynistic movement, the cultural movement that was illiberal in its methods. And I believe absolutely that there is something dangerous about this movement and it must be challenged. <sighs> Why is JK Rowling like this? Chapter 7. Why is J.K. Rowling like this? J.K. Rowling loves to quote radical feminist Andrea Dworkin, whom I've already mentioned a couple times in this video. I myself favor violence. Deeply. I favor it. Dworkin is known for her- Okay, we get the idea here. I want to take a brief detour once again. Because I am now, after having seen that section, curious about Demon Mama's 
coverage because she has a video called I changed my mind about this revisiting ContraPoints and JK Rowling. I don't know if I'll watch the whole thing, but I want to see a bit of it. Maybe she'll change my mind. Files of JK Rowling. And I actually quite overall enjoyed the video. Uh, I had a few critiques, um, one of which was relatively substantial. Um, but I wanted to say there was something that I didn't talk about very much that I have been thinking of. Um, I've been I've been thinking back on, and I'm not sure like how to feel about it. Um, and I wanted to talk about it and make like a little bit of an addition uh, to what I was talking about um, last night. And basically, I've seen a lot of people, and actually, my own partner. Uh, brought up to me some issues that they had with the ending of the video and uh, Oh the very ending of the video, huh? Fuck. Do we have to go through the whole thing for, for this to make sense? I guess there's just like 29 minutes left. We're almost there We're almost there. I'm gonna grab some water. We're gonna we're gonna continue. So I'll be right back Remember if you like what I do Patreon link in the description. You should definitely join the discord server and uh, Super chat me and I'll read out your comments I'll be right back.
All right. 30 minutes to go. Let's do this. Her extreme sex negative views, which I don't agree with, but she was an interesting writer, one of those half crazed savants who gets in your head, who you can't stop thinking about. In my opinion, Dworkin's best book is Right Wing Women, published in 1983, the era of Phyllis Schlafly and Anita Bryant. Right Wing Women is an analysis of why so many women are drawn to conservative politics, seemingly against their own interests. Anyone who's interested in understanding the gender critical movement, a crypto reactionary backlash disguising itself as feminism, should read this book. In Dworkin's analysis, the political right makes certain metaphysical and material promises to women that both exploit and quiet some of women's deepest fears. No one can bear to live a meaningless life. Women fight for meaning. Why is it like Sith chanting in the background of this voiceover? It's terrifying, but I like it. Just as women fight for survival. <clears throat> and conservative politics promises women meaning. The right offers women a simple, fixed, predetermined social, biological, and sexual order. Form conquers chaos. Form banishes confusion. The gender critical movement offers women a brutally simple understanding of sex and gender. A woman is an adult human female. Right-wing anti-trans activist Posey Parker has made this phrase into the motto of the gender critical movement. Adult human female. It's on billboards, it's on t-shirts, it's on banners, signs, and tweets. Presented with the authority of a dictionary definition, it's rigid, it's orderly, it's immutable. There are no exceptions, there are no blurred lines, there can be no change. This mantra is a defense against the conceptual instability and chaos that gender criticals fear. Chaos. The same fear that once drove homophobic women like Anita Bryant. Just Erasing the concept of sex removes the ability of many. They can only reproduce metaphysically to meaningfully discuss their lives. Dworkin says, Within the frame of male domination, there is a good reason for women to hate homosexuality, both male and female. Women are interchangeable as sex objects. Women are slightly less disposable as mothers. The only dignity and value women get is as mothers. Having children is the one social contribution credited to women. It is the bedrock of women's social worth. Without childbearing, women know they have nothing. Homosexuality for women means having nothing. It means extinction. Substitute transgenderism for homosexuality, and you'll understand the gender critical movement. J.K. Rowling's definition of woman is this. The woman is um, the producer of the large gametes. The producer of the large gametes. Rowling says her primary concern about- Oh, you mean like a birthing person. A young trans men is the loss <clears throat> of fertility. Homosexuality, its rise in public visibility, attempts to socially legitimize or protect it, makes women expendable. The one thing women can do and be valued for will no longer be valued. Male homosexuality is especially terrifying because it suggests a world without women altogether, a world in which women are extinct. This exact fear appears frequently in gender critical rhetoric. Trans activists are erasing women. They're erasing biological sex. They're going to call us pregnant people. Confused girls are being robbed of their precious fertility. Trans women are going to replace biological women. As a woman, I feel threatened because biological men are aggressively replacing women. You will not replace us! Sometimes this paranoia ramps up to the point of obsession and the results can be dazzling. In September 2022, Maya Forstadter, who you'll remember as the anti-trans activist whom JK Rowling came out as a turf to defend, went on a full-blown Twitter rampage because the Hertfordshire County Libraries announced they were changing their children's storytime mascot from the Bookstart Bear. If you don't know where this is going, strap in from the Bookstart Bear to a bright, vibrant, gender-neutral creature called Tala. Are you enraged? Yes. <laughs> if not, you haven't been spending enough time Bring on back Mimsnet. the ghost Maya bear. Maya the words of an indignant mother who referred to Talia, wait, wasn't it Tala? Referring to Talia as a trans bear with they, them pronouns, describing the mascot as ideological, creepy, 
and gaslighting. I cannot express how upset I feel. The library jumped in to clarify that Tala, not Talia, isn't trans, they are an alien. Maya then demanded to They're know bear. how this alien was birthed. Did it attach Wait, from an egg? Wait, are they a bear? Or was it born from a mama? Some people tried to reason with Maya. There's an advantage in having a character that isn't identifiably male or female, as it can be equally relatable to either sex and avoid promoting gender stereotypes. But Maya was not convinced. It seems highly unlikely that an alien that had evolved with such recognizable vertebrate body plan is the Frankfurt School poisoned by M&Ms and beer. You mean the Franklin School. You need to get this right. There's people watching this. It's not sexually reproducing. It's a relatable anthropomorphic character, not a slime mold. I need to know how the alien fucks right now. I said I need to know how the alien fucks before I can show it to my child. <laughs> When Twitter understandably laughed it up at Maya's expense, she just kept posting. <laughs> and she posted hard. Honestly, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone post so hard. In a lengthy diatribe, Maya wrote about the miseries of new motherhood. You are in charge of a baby. You have never done this before. You haven't had a good night's sleep for months and won't for years. Everyone has an opinion on what you are doing right and wrong, and you've become invisible. You had politics. You had a career. You had interests. You had a sex life. Now you have the daily needs of a completely dependent person and your world has shrunk. The fact that these men and the young women that cheer them on think this is so laughable reflects society's disdain for mothers. This is what it means to Contra say- sounds like, uh, <clears throat> uh, Dimitrescu from, uh, Resident Evil Village here, I just realized. A woman is not a feeling or a costume. This is why the hub of the resistance is on mum's net. <laughs> so I am fascinated by this thread. I think it's one of the most revealing texts in gender critical history. Because you know what? Maya Forstetter actually does have valid concerns. But the concerns she has that are valid have nothing to do with trans people. And they definitely have nothing to do with an adorable cartoon alien. <laughs> Honestly, reading this, I bear? have some It looks concerns. like a bear. It's got like concerns, the paws and everything. Like, where is Maya's husband? I know she has one. Isn't raising children supposed to be a mutual project? No one should have to feel this alone, raising children. That is a valid concern. Oh my God, we actually found one. It's like finding El Dorado. A valid concern. A valid concern. Isn't what's going on here that Maya is taking legitimate feelings of being overburdened and underappreciated and displacing those feelings onto transgender people? This is exactly how the gender critical movement recruits by providing a scapegoat to frustrated women. It's not your husband's neglect. It's not the increasing atomization of society. It's not the indignities of aging. It's Tala, the non-binary alien with its dungarees and smug aura of gender neutrality. Mum's net is the- Presence blue, but the other bear was blue. That's a bear. You're a bunch of speciesists. Hub of the resistance. <laughs> to non-binary cartoons. It's too much, these people are too much. Okay, we have to be serious now. The political right also promises women safety and security. For women, the world is a very dangerous place. The right acknowledges the reality of danger, the validity of fear. The right then manipulates the fear. Women fear and resent male violence, which they're most likely to experience from the men closest to them. Kala may be the bear from Annihilation, but it's a bear. Boyfriends, husbands, and fathers. They're most likely to be killed by sexual partners. But the need to survive in a male-dominated society means that women's legitimate fears and resentments often cannot be directed at the men with power. Inevitably, this causes women to take the rage and contempt they feel for the men who actually abuse them, those close to them, and project it onto others, those far away, foreign, or different. And this displacement of rage is just transparently what's going on with J.K. Rowling. In her essay about sex and gender issues, Rowling speculates that trans men are transitioning to be the son her father wanted. I really felt the rejection of my father, and that is one of the things that maybe leads someone going into homosexuality. 
and she describes the lingering trauma from her first violent marriage. The marriage at this point has turned very violent and very controlling. And that, she says, is why she decided to speak out against the transgender movement. If you try to understand this rationally, it looks like a total non sequitur. But if you look at it emotionally, there's a kind of logic to it. The existence of the dangerous outsider always functions for women simultaneously <clears throat> as deception, diversion, painkiller, and threat. Women cling to irrational hatreds focused particularly on the unfamiliar so that they will not murder their fathers, husbands, sons, brothers, lovers, the men with whom they are intimate, those who do hurt them. In the 1970s, many conservative women displaced this rage onto lesbians, the threatening outsider of the day. Dworkin attended the National Women's Conference in 1977, where she spoke to a lot of women about their fear of lesbians. Right-wing women consistently spoke to me about lesbians as if lesbians were rapists, certified committers of sexual assault against women and girls. To them, the lesbian was inherently monstrous, experienced almost as a demonic sexual force hovering closer and closer. Here's my problem with this, um, with this whole approach. Plausible, very plausible. Maybe this is an apt description of how the right works generally. Maybe this is a, a very apt description of how the gender critical movement and people like them uh, recruit and how they operate propagandistically, maybe. Um, You cannot refer the actions of public figures to their daddy issues. Um, I, I, I'm so, I'm sorry. Like, just as just as Vosh was pig-headed and prideful and defended his ego at the expense of stuff that mattered, which is why that falling out with Contra went down the way it did, and which is which is why like everything after that was a fucking disaster. Um, Rowling can be prideful and vindictive and uh, for, for personal reasons decide to carry on a line that she knows in the back of her head she has not justified. That's a thing she can do. Putting all of this back to the troubled past of women in a patriarchal society is not sufficient. I'm sorry. closer. She was the dangerous intruder, encroaching, threatening by her very presence a sexual order that cannot bear scrutiny or withstand challenge. It's almost surreal to read this because of how precisely it describes how gender criticals talk about trans women. Pronouns are like rohypnol. They dull your defenses. They change your inhibitions. They're meant to. Now it's true that trans-exclusionary radical feminism began as an offshoot of far-left lesbian separatism, with academic feminist Janice Raymond writing in 1979 that transsexualism should be morally mandated out of existence. But the gender critical movement was always destined to become a right-wing movement because it has the structure of a right-wing <clears throat> movement. Like, okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Here's where you can refer all of this to J.K. Rowling's bad history, right? If she changes her tune, starts repairing the damage she's done, and then explains, hey, well, why were you doing all of this? Why were, you, why were you, like, attacking this whole group? Well, because of this stuff. It clouded my head. I had a bunch of, like, boogeymen in the, in the back of my brain, and it was making me react in an irrational way towards people who had done me no wrong. Then you can be charitable that way. You don't have to be, but then you can be. When you're doing it at this juncture, you're giving her a free pass. Taking women's fear and rage toward familiar men and displacing it onto an unfamiliar outsider. The momentum behind this is just too ripe an opportunity for conservatives to pass up. As Dworkin says, Because women so displace their rage, they are easily controlled and manipulated haters. Women require symbols of danger that justify their fear. 
The right provides these symbols of danger by designating clearly defined groups of outsiders as sources of danger. In the 2020s, anti-trans bigotry has become a keystone of conservative party platforms, both in the UK, where Lee Anderson, deputy chair of the conservative party, predicts that the next election okay. will be- what does that tell you? This has become like a part of, a part of like mainstream conservative political platforms. They're staking the future of their party and their careers and their reputations on it. What does that tell you? It means that there are real material reasons to toe this line that do not stem from personal trauma. And you know what's actually really sexist is assuming that women can't cynically deploy this. One on probably a, cult, a mixture of culture wars and trans debate. And in the US, where the ACLU is currently tracking more than 450 anti LGBT bills, including more than 130 gender affirming care bans, 51 trans sports bans, 40 drag bans, 29 trans bathroom bans, and 21 bans defining trans people out of the law. Republicans have escalated anti-trans rhetoric to eliminationist extremes that have most trans people in this country living in a constant state of fear for our future. Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The left is attacking our children, pushing sex talk, transgender extremism, and noxious politics in our schools. We should reject this demonic assault on the innocence of this man looks like if you rubbed a cloth on his face, it would come apart like a slinky with how many wrinkles are underneath that caked on makeup. Our children and stand fast against leftist efforts to mutilate their bodies and minds. Stop confusing our babies with your groomer gender ideologue. I will re- That has to be the most uncharismatic speaker I've ever seen in my life. Like, dear God, that was like nails on a chalkboard. Invoke every Biden policy promoting the chemical castration and sexual mutilization of our youth. And ask Congress to send me a bill prohibiting child sexual mutilation in all 50 states. On day one, I will revoke Joe Biden's cruel policies on so-called gender-affirming care. Ridiculous. I will sign a new executive order instructing every federal agency to cease all programs that promote the concept of sex and gender transition at any age. A few gender criticals still want to insist they have nothing to do with right-wing anti-trans bigots, like Helen Lewis. I mean, turf is basically witch. Who attempts in her interview in the witch trials of JK Rowling to distinguish mm. between the transphobia of the far right and that of feminists. I think the hardest thing for outsiders to understand is that there are two different arguments going on. One is the traditional conservative right argument, which is anti-LGBT. The other one is a criticism from the left, in which it says, sometimes male people and female people have different interests, no matter how the male people identify. But as a trans person, I don't care whether you justify your transphobia in the name of protecting women or protecting children. Whether it's radical feminist Janice Raymond calling for transsexualism to be morally mandated out of existence, or conservative Catholic Michael Knowles calling for transgenderism to be eradicated from public life, is the same repulsive bigotry to me. And in any case, the gender critical movement has recently reached an implicit consensus that they're mostly done pretending to be feminist. The rising star of the movement, Posey Parker, AKA Kelly J. Keene Minchel, rejects feminism entirely. Do you call yourself a feminist now? No. Did no. you ever call yourself a feminist? I probably did for a short time. But so you wouldn't be said like a Julie Bindle type feminist? No, or? well, some feminists, I mean, Julie Bindle has been critical of um, mothers in the past. And I think that's a, th that's a theme flowing through feminism. I'm not a feminist. I'm not a feminist. This is not Andrea Dworkin. This is Phyllis Schlafly. Parker's campaign is currently funded by the right-wing CPAC. CPAC came along and said that they would sponsor our events and cover all of our insurance throughout our whole trip, uh, which is really kind of them. Um, but what we would need to do is we would need to show that we were working for them, working with them. 
She has no qualms about collaborating with far-right white nationalists. I want to talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Let me tell you what she's been saying. She's a Republican, but she, uh, I agree with her wholeheartedly. She's opposed abortion and contraception for teenagers. Why are we enabling um, children to take um, sometimes contraceptives that, that are quite harmful or access to abortion. Um, I think that we really need to rethink all of this. I think parents need to take back control of their children. She's called trans people fools and perverts. Transgenderism is nuts. It's for fools and perverts. She's denied that transgender is a legitimate concept. It's not a real thing. There's no such thing as being born in the wrong body. There's no such thing as a trans woman. There's no such thing as a trans person. There is no such thing. There are people that call themselves these things that may have other issues manifesting that then make them think they're this, but no, we have to stop using any words like transgender. Um, you know, there may be more words that we have to say in order to say that. We may call it transgender ideology, uh, but when it comes to a person, they may be following transgender ideology, but they are not transgender. There is no such thing as a man or a woman being anything other than a man or a woman. She's called trans women pedophiles. We know that if a man has a paraphilia addressing as a woman, the most likely cross paraphilia is pedophilia. You can't have both, guys. Fools will never be perverts. Perverts will never be fools. So God made you. Sorry. We know that these men have multiple paraphilias. They don't ever stop at one. She's said that each and every woman who stands in her way will be annihilated. <laughs> each and every uh, one of you women who stand in my way, each and every one of you, let me just tell you, you will be annihilated. <laughs> She's called on armed men to enter women's mm. restrooms to attack anyone they perceive as not a real woman. And men, for once. Hang on, let me read that, that email. <clears throat> Dear men, anyone can be a woman if they say so in the USA. So as soon as you're feeling a little feminine, you can use the women's toilets, changing rooms, etc. I'm especially talking to you lovely men who consider yourselves to be protectors. There's no material difference between you and the men who call themselves women all the time. Please ensure not to break any laws so you really do have to say that you feel like a woman for a moment, but it can be very fleeting. This is a great way for American men who care about women to... Oh. Uh, well, actually, it 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 is still illegal to uh, ab abuse other people in the washroom, regardless of whether you identify as the gender to which the washroom is allocated receive as not a real woman and then for once i'm talking to you i'm talking about you dads who maybe carry i think that's what you say uh, i'm so down with the american lingo maybe you carry maybe you don't uh maybe you consider yourself a protector of women maybe you're that sort of man um maybe you have a daughter or a mother or a wife uh Maybe you have a sister, maybe you just have some friends. Maybe you just think women are human and you don't need any absolute connection with them to feel compelled to protect us. Um, I think you should start using women's toilets, men. And she said that women who call themselves men should be sterilized, which seems to be a little bit in tension. Why? If you're gender critical, wouldn't you be calling for the sterilization of people you think are still women? That's, that's, like, even just assuming her vantage point, that's strange. Like, that, that's, that's from a place of just sheer hatred. That's not, that's, that's not advocating for a confused conception of things. That's, she just hates people who identify as trans, categorically with J.K. Rowling's concern about the fertility of confused girls. You know, you might look at these differences of opinion between Rowling and Parker, little things like pro-feminist versus anti-feminist, left versus right, pro-abortion versus anti-abortion. Hang on, what's this? Let's go back a little bit. You know, you might look at these differences of opinion between Rowling and Parker, little things like pro-feminist versus anti-feminist, okay. left versus right, pro-abortion versus anti-abortion, concern about trans men's fertility versus 
advocating for sterilization of trans men, against annihilating women who stand in your way, versus pro-annihilating each and every woman who stands in your way, you might look at these differences and expect that these two women would be at odds, but they aren't. Because promoting anti-trans bigotry is a common cause that for both of them trumps all else. In 2020, Posey Parker paid for a poster reading I Heart JK Rowling to be displayed at a railway station in Edinburgh. And Rowling has tweeted in defense of Parker numerous times and has modeled her t-shirts. So the gender critical movement started by lesbian separatists in the 1970s, has finally passed into the hands of pound shop Ava Browns, as gender critical lesbian Julie Bindel memorably described them. It's a movement that has no beliefs apart from a shared determination to reduce the number of trans people. In the numbers we're currently seeing, particularly of young people coming forward. That was well stated. I find cause for doubt. Yes. In the meantime, while we're, while we're trying to get through to the decision makers, we have to try to limit the harm. And that means reducing or keeping down the number of people who transition. And that's for two reasons. One of them is that every one of those people is a person who's been damaged. But the second one is every one of those people is basically, you know, a huge problem to a sane world. Like if you've got people, that, and whether they're transitioned, whether they're happily transitioned, whether they're unhappily transitioned, whether they're detransitioned, if you've got people who've dissociated from their sex in some way. Imagine the, the arrogance it must take to just assert my position is the position of a sane world. That's like godlike arrogance. To, to say that. It, it's insane. It takes very little education to, to have that attitude. Every one of those people is someone who needs special accommodation in a sane world where we re-acknowledge the, the truth of sex. So to wrap this up, is the backlash against JK Rowling a witch hunt? Unequivocally, no. It's very thoroughly deserved. But I will say this, a movement can't get along without a devil. And across the whole political spectrum, there is a misogynistic tendency to choose a female devil, whether it's Anita Bryant, Hillary Clinton, Marie Antoinette, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, or JK Rowling. I don't think that's fair. I don't think she was picked out because she's female. I think she was picked out because she's one of a kind. Um, this is a popular, massively popular author who isn't a Michael Knowles, isn't a Trump, isn't somebody who only appeals to, like, specifically politically engaged people. This is someone who specifically appeals to generations now of, of young people before they're politically awakened. Um, and who is specifically using a, in a certain sense, a superficially uh, uh, political, a superficial political neutrality and, and her status is as like uh, as, as kind of a household name and an icon um, to insert this stuff really insidiously into communities that otherwise have zero political exposure there are people who will read Harry Potter who will read about all those crazy dumb activists who are being ridiculous to her on Twitter who won't go on to Twitter will never actually see any of this or follow through and they'll just vote in favor of getting rid of uh, anything that smacks of trans advocacy because they've been spooked by these stories given to them third hand of this being a part of a big woke cabal to limit their freedoms and put them all into Orwell's 1984. That's, that's what happens. Um, this makes her uniquely dangerous. She's situated in a very specific and unusual way. You cannot put this down to her just being a woman. I'm sorry. And there's always going to be people who seize on any opportunity to be misogynistic. So... He didn't seize on any opportunity to be misogynistic. That's a mischaracterization. She was, she was pretending to advocate on behalf of women. She was using her, um, her uh, history of, if memory serves, she was using her history of abuse at the hands of her ex-husband. Am I remembering this incorrectly? She was using something about her history um, to uh, 
as as a bludgeon against trans women in particular. Um, and Vosh made an uncouth remark. He is not champing at the bit to make misogynistic statements. That's not true or fair. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like that that's a ridiculous statement. And it smacks of some kind of bitterness. I don't I don't know why. I don't think there was any real cost to contrapoints in all of this. I think the only one who lost was Vaj. So what's the reason? Why bring that up? What's the purpose? I'm gonna I'm I'm doubling down a little bit on my earlier read. Um, I am now about sixty percent confident in it. I think what's actually happening is good video overall, by the way, very good video. But I think what's happening here, the reason for the Vosh inclusion, is because she's specifically trying to set herself up to have public conversations with figures in the Rowling. Uh, Posey Parker sort of sphere. Maybe not them directly, but people in that general orbit. And to that end, uh, humanizing them, even in a way that seems a little bit inappropriate, or is overly generous, like to the point of sanitizing them somewhat. I disagreed with the last section there quite strongly, in terms of its deployment. Um, I think assigning J.K. Rowling's bigotry to her past history is, is presumptuous in the extreme, and gives her way way too much leeway, more so than would be offered to anybody else, including Vosh, incidentally, in, in, in this video. Um, but uh, I, I think she wants to discourse with people in that sphere. And to that end, Vosh is a convenient sacrifice. He's a big lefty creator. Uh, he has a specific history with her. He's not doing so hot. He's not on the upward ascent like he was before. He's kind of stagnated. He lost a lot of subs when that all went down. He folded in into a protective ball, and he didn't come out of it yet. And I think he's still traumatized from the thing, if I had to guess. Um, and, and she's offering him up as a sacrifice. Because this positions her very well to that crowd. It doesn't position her in a great way towards anybody else so that's that's my that's my bet now by the way that's not necessarily a bad strategy um and there's also a possibility that she could actually do some good if she succeeds in doing so if that's the plan and if this is purely vindictive then it's just dumb um it's still kind of a nasty thing to do but at least then it wouldn't be completely useless but I uh, it's it's probably completely useless I'm probably giving everybody too much credit I always do that people think I don't but I do party the conservative party the devil is patriarchy are they gonna notice this though who's gonna watch a two-hour video essay to see contra posturing well that's a misjudgment on her part I'm trying to discern why on earth this is included like <laughs> You have to watch a two-hour video essay to get to the part about Vosh anyways. Who else is... What's what's the point to anybody else seeing it? The only other people who will care are going to be pro-Vosh people. Anti-Vosh people aren't going to care. This is old news. It's done. He's already... He's... he's, he's there's nothing... You can't extract any more blood from this turnip. It's the right-wing men who will be the ones to put gender-critical theory into brutal practice. Anita Bryant, Posey Parker, and J.K. Rowling are, to borrow a term from TERFs, handmaidens. TERFs are the real handmaidens. They're useful idiots who put a concerned female face on the patriarchal violence against trans people that will ultimately be enacted by right-wing men. That's naive. I'm sorry. They can hate trans people just as much as men can for the same reasons. And they do. They echo the same arguments. They aren't naive. So maybe some of them are. But the people you're talking about. They've been exposed to everything. Everything. They, they don't. This isn't like an exposure problem. They're not not seeing the arguments. They don't. They don't want to acknowledge the arguments.
I call on men to consider themselves. She's not. I know she's not wrong, but it, it also doesn't matter. Like it, it's there's there's more to a sentence than just its content. There's what's the sentence doing in the context of an argument. These are human beings to call out the deviants among them and eradicate these monsters from society. And Megan Phelps Roper and centrist Slaker are wrong that civil conversation can resolve this. Call out the deviants among them and eradicate these monsters from society. People like Michael Knowles and Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump cannot be persuaded. They have to be defeated. As for what to do about J.K. Rowling, honestly, let's all just block her. Open up Twitter right now, go to her profile, and just block her. Problem solved. There's just one problem. Let's, let's go back a little bit here, okay? Where's the... Here, I'll, sh I'll show you what the problem is. what to do about J.K. Rowling. Honestly, let's all just block her. Open up... Okay. We're going to zoom in a little bit. I want you to tell me what you see. There's a number on the screen. Okay? It's, it's, it's one of two numbers, actually. It's under her name. So right here it says she follows 1,090 people. It's not a lot of people, actually. I'm kind of surprised she only follows 1,090 people. Next up, you'll see a number that says 14 million followers. 14 million. There's another number on my screen that you can't see at the moment, but I'm going to scroll down a little bit so you can. This video, as of the 17th of April, is now the 23rd, has 2.3 million views. Let's make that bigger so you can see it. 2.3 million views. Of those views, I would wager the vast majority, like myself, will not be blocking J.K. Rowling, despite agreeing with most of her thesis, uh, Contra's thesis, despite being adamantly opposed to Contra, or to, fuck, to J.K. Rowling on, on, on political grounds, and especially on trans issues, on gender issues, I guess, is more appropriate when we're talking about J.K. Rowling. Um, but let's assume... Two million people just suddenly blocked J.K. Rowling, and she's still twelve million more. I would wager that probably a few hundred people blocked J.K. Rowling as a result of this. Maybe a few thousand. And uh, oh, that, that's assuming, by the way, that these people were following J.K. Rowling to begin with. Maybe. That does absolutely nothing except give J.K. Rowling free reign and dominance on that platform. Maybe that's unavoidable anyways, but blocking her accomplishes literally nothing. Literally nothing. And you know it accomplishes literally nothing, Contra, because you delete your tweets because they matter. You delete your tweets frequently because there is fallout to you getting negative attention on Twitter. So, uh, and that's assuming that everybody watched two hours into the video to get to this point. You should have led with this. This it took an hour and forty nine minutes to get here. Of these two million views, how many people do you honestly think watched attentively to the end? You're entertaining, Contra, but you're not that entertaining. I'm tired. Okay. Oh my god. Ugh. Turn up Twitter right now, go to her profile, and just block her. Problem solved. Like, don't harass her, that doesn't help. But also, I wouldn't wait for her to change. She's gone down what I call the bigotry whirlpool. Her changing doesn't matter. The point is not her changing. Every time she gets mad, every time she responds to the wrong person, that is an opportunity for her to make a mistake that will disadvantage her and that will potentially limit the efficacy of her message. What you're talking about is Vosh's fortress arc writ large, and it's dumb. The deeper you go in, the harder it is to leave, for the same reasons that it's hard to quit a cult or scam. To quote video essayist Dan Olson, 
One of the most insidious elements of a confidence scam is that the victims who invested the most are often the most passionate defenders, because shame is a powerful force in the human psyche, and they can't bear the shame of admitting they were tricked. Reformed bigots have to face not only the shame of being dupes, but also the guilt of having devoted years of life to harming vulnerable people. And the question of how to properly commodify it afterwards, because that's what this person did. This is something Megan, to her credit, faced head on. If we were wrong, then I had spent every day of my life industriously sowing doom, discord, and rage to so many not at the behest of God, but of my grandfather. I had wasted my life only to fill others with pain and misery. Ooh, that is an interesting question, No Truce. Thank you for the $22. Which person do you think Contra blocked first, Vosh or J.K. Rowling? Well, um, I don't know. Did she, uh, did she have her blocked before the video? I have no idea. Um, here's something else, too. Uh, just, just, uh, the endless charity being given to celebrities who happen to be transphobes. Like, I, I don't, I don't get it. I just don't get it. I mean, I do if I'm cynical, but I'm... It's, it's, it's silly. This is the problem with the whole depersoning aspect to all this. This is why I keep talking about this. Because the issue is not just that person people don't get to take part in the in the marketplace of ideas. Um, the issue is that when consequences befall them from any of this, we don't watch a video about them individually and pity them and and the their 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 desperate, horrible, unfortuitous circumstances. They just die anonymously. Okay? Nobody's nobody's shedding tears for the individuals who listened to J.K. Rowling, got all into a huff, and then uh, finally, finally let their trans daughter know what they really think. Right? N no, nobody, nobody's thinking about those people. Because they don't exist. This person exists because she's famous. Because she was a famous bigot. And therefore, it doesn't matter what she does. Because she has that as capital to fall back on. This isn't a person who got out of the church and then went to go work a day job somewhere. This is a person who immediately commodified that. That says something. Most bigots cannot stand to face this moral sunk cost. It's why an obsessive bigot like Graham Linehan, whose all-consuming hatred of trans people has ruined his life cost him his marriage, and left him alone to tweet about destroying gender ideology minutes before midnight on New Year's Eve. Let's be realistic. Somebody in that position, their marriage was destroyed by something else as well. Feels psychologically compelled to insist with ever more certainty that trans people are not just delusional or dangerous, but are all demonic perverts, an enemy so hyperbolically evil that they justify his self-immolating crusade. They took everything from me, you know. He took my, he took my, fa my family, you know. And I just said, no, hang on a sec. Stop calling these women turfs. Stop sending them abuse. Let them speak. And for that, they they just destroyed me. Do you honestly feel destroyed? No, because because the one thing about this, the one thing about this that keeps me going is that I know I'm right, you know. <laughs> I know I'm right. As long as he stays here, in the oh. bottom of the whirlpool, he oh. never has to face that he's ruined his relationships and wasted years of life because he just couldn't let it go. And if J.K. Rowling doesn't log off soon, this will likely be her fate as well. It won't because she's more famous in a different way than, uh, that guy. Why can't I fucking remember names? Graham. Check stream notes? What? What's in stream notes? What am I looking for here? 
Oh, palate cleanser. Um, I'm not going to look at those today, but, but thank you for that. All right, well, that's that. Well, let's see what Demon Mama said. I... <sighs> oh, hang on, what? Oh, my, okay, fine, fine, I'll look at the thing. Don't say I don't do anything for you. Which one is it? Is it the Amazing Atheist one? Which one is a blue stone? Oh. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. God, you people whine so much. Okay, here we go. So I logged onto my Twitter today, and I saw that I was suddenly embroiled in this, like, firestorm of, like, all these different crazy people hating on me and stuff. And I was just like, what I do? I don't know. Um, I saw that they'd resurrected a tweet from may 13th 2011 where i said i wish i was a jew and they said all kinds of like anti-semitic stuff they were talking about how hang on let's see this resurrect for some reason a bunch of right-wingers okay that's that's recent did a tweet from may 13th 2011 where i said i wish i was a jew and they said all kinds of, like, anti-Semitic stuff. They were talking about how, like, the Talmud allows pedophilia and how, like, it's disgusting and I need therapy. All because I said I want to be a Jew. And, uh, of course, these people are raging anti-Semites who just despise Jews. Um, and I was like, where did these people come from? Well, it turns out they come from J.K. motherfucking Rowling author of the harry potter books books i have read multiple times movies i have seen multiple times she i posted a, a tweet where i was like pregnant men girl dicks pregnant men girl dicks just bait for the chuds just trying to trigger some chuds but little did i know i was going to attract the queen of the chuds little did i know that my simple little bait tweet was going to to hook the queen of the turfs herself jk motherfucking rowling and the best thing is she said say what you like about gender ideology you can't deny it's attracted some of the world's greatest thinkers and that means that jk rowling just called me one of the world's greatest thinkers i mean true it was completely sarcastic and was meant to be like this withering scorn filled thing but I immediately put that in my fucking bio. World's greatest thinker, J.K. Rowling. 100% true. She did say it. And even better than hey, that... some of. Some of. You're just, you're just one of many. Don't get your head full of steam. She found out about the fucking banana video. People keep telling me about the banana. I had no need or wish to know about the banana. Oh my god. I have banana. peaked. This is it. This, it's not going to get any better than this. I cannot take this shit any... I thought the highest I was ever going to get... What did he do with a banana? ...was when I got international headlines for complaining about the size of Lara Croft's tits. But this is better than that. This tops that. This is next level. This is the most popular author probably alive today. Just decided to respond to my bait tweet with some withering British sarcasm. And that's fucking beautiful. The only thing that kind of mars this event is I'm fucking goddamn banned from Twitter again for six hours and 23, sorry, six days and 23 hours. So just when things are getting fun, just when I've got a big old hate mob that I can agitate that I can get pissed off at me, they fucking take away my Twitter again. <laughs> These fucking bastards, man. Uh, this is this Wix extrovert cousin? Oh and they took it away for the stupidest goddamn reason. 
because some psycho bitch was like, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I found that tweet where Matt Walsh was celebrating the fact that, um, that a, a pride parade in Florida was canceled. And he was like, yeah, good guys win again. I hate gay people. You know, his usual bigoted, intolerant, garbage horse shit. And I criticized him for it. And then some psycho bitch, no doubt finding me from J.K. Rowling, was like, um, hey, FBI, why don't you go arrest this fucking pedophile because he supports gay pride parades. Obviously, he's a pedophile. And I was just like, I, I added the FBI too. I was like, yeah, at FBI, come arrest me for... Uh, saying something this dumb bitch doesn't like right really that was it okay that, that was that was it bluestone okay that was i was expecting more i'm disappointed but thank you for that now now this took an additional five minutes to conclude i want to eat <laughs> i have so to say i agree with some of the criticisms that are being levied against the end of the video um but i still have some i still have some thoughts about it so Basically, at the end of the video, spoiler alert uh, for a two-hour political video essay, not really a spoilering type of thing, but at the end of the video, ContraPoints comes to the conclusion that probably the best thing that anybody could do is just block J.K. Rowling on Twitter. And... Now, at the time, I didn't really think all that much of it. In the moment, I didn't really think that much of it because I was still thinking about the previous two hours of the video, which I think the previous two hours were, by and large, the vast majority, fantastic and phenomenal. And at first, my sort of thing... I agree. Like, minus the Vosh section, that was actually a really good video most of the way through. There were elements I didn't like. I didn't like the, the seeming insinuations at points that women transphobes are motivated by trauma and are not willful, that seems simultaneously condescending and, and kind of, um, what's the word? Uh, it's like appeasing them. Um, but overall, like very, very solid argumentation. Was, uh, I, I interpreted the ending as sort of ironic. Uh, that that J.K. Rowling was echoing, or not J.K. Rowling, that, that ContraPoints was echoing what J.K. Rowling does, which is sort of hide what is really meant. Uh, this, this, like, putting on a veneer of civility. Um, <clears throat> but as I thought about it more, I don't know if that was actually true. I don't know for sure if that was what was intended by the ending of the video because as I thought on it and I read other people's critiques, I realized that I perhaps was being a little bit too charitable with the ending given certain things that were stated. Um, the, 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 the blocking, okay, so basically the argument and I'm going to try and, and steal man ContraPoints' argument here, and I'll go from there. The argument was basically, well, J.K. Rowling is a right-wing woman. Ultimately, she isn't the constructor of patriarchy. Uh, therefore, we should be careful not to just make her the, uh, the convenient effigy uh, uh, that that represents the whole of a truly hateful movement. Uh, uh, ContraPoints, in fact, made the argument that like most of the devils that, uh, that movements react to happen to have been mostly white women in the past. And uh, there is truth to that. I mean, Anita Bryant is one of them. Um, and, uh, and uh, oh my God, I'm blanking on the other lady's name. Why am I blanking on her name? It doesn't really matter. The other lady uh, are two of the mo of the examples that were covered specifically in the video. And of course, there are very frequently white women who act as basically a poster child for a hate movement that is much larger than them. And I think there's truth in that. However, I also have to point out um, that no one, no single person or entity or institution builds patriarchy. 
no single <clears throat> institution or individual builds transphobia ever. There is never just one person. But J.K. Rowling, uh, J.K. Rowling has an absolutely unbelievably large uh, platform. Like she did, yeah, she tried to make the argument that the devil was the Republican Party um, and Republican lawmakers, not J.K. Rowling. But actually, as far as um, as far as uh, like spreading a hateful message i actually think that jk rowling is more impactful than most republican lawmakers obviously she's not more you know uh powerful than the entire gop but um J she has uh more followers on twitter than ron DeSantis by a little over three times actually here check this out Four point one million. Rowling has fourteen. J.K. Rowling is infinitely more influential than Michael Knowles. J.K. Rowling is more influential than Matt Walsh. J.K. Rowling is more influential than libs of TikTok. J.K. Rowling is one of the most, the world's most influential anti-trans people. She has ra She has her her reach. And her influence as a pillar of pop culture um, is is not to be understated. And I think that's true. The problem she has what no politician can buy, which is respect. That's that's correct. She has a different kind of prestige that's cleaner than the kind of even like a running presidential candidate. Leaving aside the fact that she has she has more um, more clout than than that person as well. <clears throat> I think that there's a part of that that is missed. And the more that I thought about that ending, um, the less that I thought that it was uh, ContraPoints just kind of making a, like, making a twist on the idea that, like, you should, you should, you know, that, that all of these people hide what they actually mean in civility. And more just that, like, there was a, there was a mis, a, a, a sort of misanalysis that was applied at the end. Um, because I don't think that blocking J.K. Rowling on Twitter would actually do anything at all. Because J.K. Rowling's influence isn't just on Twitter. That's how she sort of gets the news out of what she's doing. But her influence is the fact that anytime she tweets anything, anytime she says anything publicly, every single news media organization on the planet will report her words on it. Even if she didn't have a Twitter anymore, even if nobody listened to her Twitter, if she just made a public statement via a got a bubble in my airway press release, it would be reported in every single magazine on the planet. Um, which is a lot, um, as it turns out. <clears throat> and oh, the dude who pied uh, Anita Bryant did it to tons of dudes too. Oh, well, there you go. I don't know. I felt like after I thought about it a little more that I had some that I, I may have I may have sort of misread what was being said there. And also to be fair, I was pretty tired. I was like hours into a react at that point. So I feel like I may have done a little bit of a an a, a, I was thinking about other aspects also, of Also like Dean Mama does insane long reacts. Like I, I think I think her original coverage must have been easily uh upwards of, of five hours. <clears throat> See, there's timestamps here. Fucking wild that Natalie made a whole section of her video dedicated to the pushback against Anita Bryant and how people actively opposed and shut her down, then finished with just block J.K. Rowling. That, that, yeah, that's dumb. It's it's just really dumb. Once again, like I'm I'm deeply suspicious that a lot of this isn't positioning. Um. Maybe like like poorly conceived positioning, but like maybe from her vantage, maybe with her tunnel vision, that's that's what she's doing. I, I don't, I just don't know. Brooks has been pushing me for a few minutes on why do I think the video is good, and um, actually, in answer to your question, 
I don't know. I think um, I think it's it's description of, or I think the comparison with Anita Bryant is strong. I think that's that's really strong. Um, I think the argument against civility politics that's implied at the front end of the video is really strong. And then halfway through, it's like she had a stroke or something, and she completely forgot what she was doing. And then, once again, she culminates in Vosh bad, just block JK, which is... I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Anyways, folks. That's ContraPoints. Uh, she has seen her shadow. Winter is over. Um... I'm going to send you all to Demon Mama, who is currently uh, streaming. Um, let me figure out again how to do that. Let me push the add button quickly. <clears throat> okay. Um, if you like what I do, first of all, like the stream and share the stream. This one's going to stay up. Way too long to edit, dear God. Um, I have a Patreon. Uh, I see a couple of you already signed up during the stream. That is, oh my God, that is so appreciated. Um, we're, we're getting close to the point where we don't need to worry about it at all. We kind of, kind of like dipped above and below the line for the last couple of months. Um, but that, that means so incredibly much. Um, and, uh, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell. Let's send you to Demon Mama. Um, I think she's having a pretty chill stream tonight. Let me make sure that we are sending you to the right place. I think we need to go to community um ah oh, fuck where is it hang on i got to i got to find this quickly why can i never ever figure out where the damn button is Don't want to just end the stream yet. There's there's a button I can press. Here, everyone, nobody nobody move. I got to get this. Maybe stream settings? Oh, it might be stream settings. Okay, so. Go here. Where is it? Okay, hang on, very quickly. How to raid in YouTube. Yeah, where's the redirect button? There should be a... Oh my god, okay. Where's, where's the frickin' redirect button? Oh, is it up here? Click edit customization under redirect, what? So edit. There's no redirect button. I don't understand. Oh, here we go. Damn it. Okay. We got it. I figured it out. 
Sorry, YouTube is just so bad about this. Farewell, squids. Give the imps hell. <laughs> 